because Duke Rollins injured her mommy so badly her body couldn't cope with giving birth. Jesus Christ. I had no idea that was the reason. Duke Rollins once said it to me himself. I'm the gift that keeps on giving. Joe was staring at Ren, but his thoughts were clearly drifting. Oh, no. You're not here for regular justice. You're here to kill a man with your bare hands. Ren drove away, watching them all shrink in her rearview mirror. There was something so tragic about them. She dialed Gary's number. He picked up. It's me, said Ren. What have you not told me about Duke Rollins? What do you mean? Said Gary. Is he watching me? Said Ren. Do you know something? Joe Lucchese asked me had Duke Rollins approached me and... Whoa, 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 said Gary. This is not about you. Really? said Ren. Believe it or not, no, said Gary. I'll explain tomorrow. It's late. Who is it about then? Patience sighed. Go to bed. We'll talk tomorrow. What's Lucchese like? Hmm. He's all right. Wren speak for it, you don't like him. So far, said Wren. He had a weird reaction to me, like I unsettled him. Maybe he doesn't like women, or can't take them seriously as case agents. I doubt that, said Gary. Don't make rash judgments. I don't, but we're not exactly... Stop talking, or Gary will take you off this. It's late. We're tired. He's been traveling. There's a serial killer out there. He knows how bad that is. So do we. Get some rest, said Gary. And thanks for picking him up. As Ren drove toward home, her phone beeped with a text. Denver bars are empty without you. Mouser, my drinking buddy from Breckenridge. Another text came in. Or have you erased us from your mind? There's a little dick here waiting for you. Little dick, my other drinking buddy from Breck. Work tomorrow, important day, visiting detective. Ren drove home and parked the jeep. She ran into the apartment, changed into pale gray evening trousers, a silver vest top, a chunky cuff, dark gray metallic heels, and a short gray jacket. She came down, ran onto the street, and hopped into the cab she had called on her way. It was 1.30 a.m. But she was home by 6. Chapter 37 The next morning, Ren pulled up in a cab outside Joe Lucchese's hotel at 8.30. He got in, smelling of cologne and coffee. Sexy. Hungover and horny. The jeep wouldn't start, said Ren, gesturing around the cab. Joe looked at her. She looked at him. Something passed between them. The knowledge that I may have just stepped out of or drunk the contents of a bar? Joe nodded. Tense. I've been up all night doing a lot of thinking about this he said. He had noticed the cab driver's attention on them. We both know that thinking about this is not what I've been up all night doing. This is serious, said Joe, without looking at her. We need to be at the top of our game. Shot across bow. I am serious, asshole. Seriousness and drinking are not mutually exclusive. Any serious drinker will tell you that. They got out at safe streets. Joe had paid the cab driver before Ren got the chance. Oh, blessed solid ground. Ugh, my stomach. Ren gave Joe the talk on the historical significance of the building as they walked up. He was interested. 
He told her about the old lighthouse he had lived in with his family in Ireland. Where your wife was left for dead. Are you over any of this? Are you safe on this case? Are you too personally, emotionally invested? Are any of us safe with you around? Before I picked you up last night, I read every article there is to read on you and your family, from here to Ireland and back again. Will you be an overbearing nightmare to work with? They walked into the bullpen. There were three rows of boxes stacked five high beside Ren's desk. What the fuck is this, people? She said. Hoarders, Denver. My head. Pound, 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 pound. Throb, throb, throb. They're from me, said Joe. I FedEx them ahead. The Duke Rollins files. Suitably embarrassed. Oh, she walked over. Thank you. Overbearing nightmare it is. She introduced Joe to the half-squad that was there. Gary walked into the bullpen, shook Joe's hand. Good to meet you, he said. Thanks for coming. Not a problem, said Joe. Sorry about all the files. The more we have, the better, said Gary. Ren, can you please divide this up later? But I want to read it all myself. I'm not sure anyone else has my eagle eye. No problem. Joe, if you'd like to come into my office, said Gary. Sure, said Joe. Gary turned to Ren. Ren, maybe you could take a lunch or a later. Food? No, no. Then we'll come together at 2 p.m., said Gary. The other agencies will be here by then. Crowded room, heat, the breathing of others, their existence. No. I need pineapple juice. Robbie and Everett carried all the boxes from beside Wren's desk into the conference room, lining them up against the back wall. Wren directed them from flat on her back on one of the tables. She turned her cheek to the cold surface. Her arm was stretched out, limp. Is that door closed? She said. Don't let him see me like this. Him, Joe Lucchese, said Everett. Don't worry. We like to shove the door on your shame. Robbie laughed. Progress. What was I thinking? Said Wren. Anyone? You should probably sit up, said Robbie. You'll fall asleep. You'll feel worse, says the man who has had one hangover in his entire life, said Wren. Which you caused, said Robbie. I'm an expert in hangovers because of observing yours. Depressing, said Wren. I will be silent for a short while. I need to sleep. I can't bear the thought I won't be able to. Do you want pineapple juice? said Everett. It's become my red flag to Gary, said Wren. You know something? I'm going to lay down on the bench in the ladies' room, just in case. Bang on the door if I'm not back by 1.50. Just so we're clear, a.m. or p.m., said Everett. The briefing began at 10 after 2. Joe Lucchese stood at the top of the conference room, solid, confident, but with eyes that showed he hadn't slept much. Ren had taken the position as far from him and Gary as she could. She was clutching a bottle of water. Duke Rollins, said Joe, is a brutal rapist, a serial killer, an animal. He is a psychopath in its truest form. Chapter 38 In 1988, at 17 years old, Rollins carried out his first rape murder with his accomplice, his childhood friend Donald Riggs, said Joe. Riggs was weaker, less intelligent, pliable, and impressionable. Together, they went on to rape and murder nine women that we know of all along I-35 in Texas, up until the late 1990s. 
No one realized that they were dealing with more than one killer. It was called the Kruska Killer Investigation, singular. Rollins and Riggs stopped raping and murdering, only because Rollins was jailed for a different crime, stabbing a guy in a parking lot. In 2004, Donald Riggs, working alone, branched off from their traditional targets and crimes and kidnapped an eight-year-old girl for ransom in New York City. I was on that case. I shot Donald Riggs dead. And from that moment on, Duke Rollins had me in his sights. When he got out of prison, he tracked me and my family down, followed us to Ireland. He raped and murdered a woman the day he arrived, a complete stranger, a crime of opportunity. He might have done the same with some of your victims. He can switch from organized to impulsive, just like that. He went on to find himself a new accomplice, a young woman this time. A heavy girl, vulnerable, insecure, and, like Donald Briggs, inferior to him intellectually. He used her to lure me into a trap. He stabbed her. I came across her on the roadside. I drove her to get help, but it was a ruse. Rollins ambushed us before I got her to the hospital. He took her away and killed her. But he didn't rape her. Nor did he rape the second woman who was there that night. He did, however, go on to violently assault her. The second woman being your wife. And he is now raping only with a foreign object, said Wren. Whether that is a physical or a psychological issue. Rollins may be working alone now, said Joe. Or he may have another accomplice. Other than Kurt Vine, said Glenn Buddy. Joe nodded. It's possible. And that person could be either male or female. Obviously, using a female accomplice would make it a whole lot easier to lure a female target. That's if Rollins' approach is to engage with his victims first, rather than just bundling them into the back of a vehicle. A brave silence descended. Duke Rollins is, said Joe, without doubt, the most dangerous and disturbed man I have ever met. He paused. Do not engage with him. Why are you looking at me, you sexist? I knew it. You're going to believe that you can handle Duke Rollins, said Joe. He's just one man, right? Still looking at me. But he's more than that, said Joe. If you're unfortunate enough to be sucked in by him, he will manipulate you in ways you won't predict, no matter how smart you are. Joe started to pace, finally looking away. He stopped dead, facing them all. It is important to note that Duke Rollins will follow through on his threats, almost immediately. He will barely give you time to act. If he gives you a choice, it's not really a choice. Its purpose is to torture you in whatever way he wants to. Beneath the surface evil of Duke Rollins, there's a well that's already ready to pump up a fresh supply. It goes straight to hell. Jesus Christ. I can't wait to get close to him. Joe Lucchese looked at Wren. I said that out loud. Gary cut in, a look of scarcely buried fury on his face. You don't want to meet him, trust me. Everyone turned to Gary now. I worked on the original Crosscut Killer investigation. What the what now? Wren looked between Joe and Gary. Hold on, she said, without thinking. Joe, so... You came to Denver not just for this, but because your son lives here. 
And that's why your daughter traveled with you. Jo looked like she had betrayed a confidentiality. Gary looked a little surprised by the revelation. Yes, we were coming to visit my son, said Jo, stiffly. Then I got Gary's call. Duke Rollins targeted you and your family before, said Wren. You don't think he'd do that again? Also, considering that now, in this one city, he's got you, who shot his best friend, and Gary, who worked his original case. Both law enforcement officers under one roof? Boom. You think all this is about us? Said Joe. About me and Gary? Ooh, scornful tone. Nice. He followed you before, said Wren. Hello. Then why didn't he just come to New York after me again? Said Joe. Because you were probably hypervigilant there, said Wren. When was the last time you heard from Duke Rollins? Seven years ago, said Joe. Do you think there might be anything significant in that passing of years? Said Wren. This is not about my family, said Joe. Beyond dismissive. And he's never come after mine, said Gary. I wouldn't have brought my daughter here if I thought we were targets, said Joe. There has to be another reason Duke Rollins is in Denver. Wren turned to Gary with a pleading look in her eye. Is this guy for real? Gary returned her look with a warning glare. After the briefing, Gary called Wren to his office. Wren sat down. This already does not look good. Wren, I'm going to have to take you off as case agent on this. I may not have heard that correctly. Gary gave her his steadying look. I don't believe it's safe, under these new circumstances, for any woman to be on this case. And specifically not for you. I'm concerned you're going to take risks. Can I just point out that Rollins has never touched a female law enforcement officer? Said Wren. A female law enforcement officer has never been on the case, said Gary. Wren, you're in a trek. I'm not his type, said Wren, and you know it. He likes scrawny blondes. And anyway, I have moves. She raised her hands, straight, karate style. Gary looked at her patiently. Law enforcement officers, by their nature, are people he clearly has a problem with. So, male or female, that makes you his type. Thereby negating your point, anyone who leads this is under threat. I'm trying to protect you, said Gary. You look excited by this. I fucking am. It's not excitement. It's focus. I believe that I will succeed where those who have gone before me have failed. Gary leaned forward. You believe... He paused. Bren, don't believe you are invincible, please. Not this again. I'm focused. That's it. That's a positive. Don't take me off this. Gary sat back. If you take one risk, go off alone. Try and lure this guy somewhere. Foiled again. I won't take risks. Gary studied her face. Something in his expression changed. Don't die on me, Wren. Not a chance. I'm invincible. Gary leaned in, his face set. Wren. Let me tell you about Duke Rollins and law enforcement. When I was in Stinger's Creek, working on the Crosscut Killer investigation, I was with a rookie, a nice kid, fresh out of the academy. We went to Bill Rollins' house, Duke Rollins' uncle. He had died in jail not long into a prison term for killing a woman called Rachel Wade. At this point, I had no clue that Duke Rollins was the killer. He wasn't on our radar, on anyone's radar. 
I didn't know he existed. I was going to Bill Rollins' house because I was thinking that Rachel Wade may have been connected to the other missing women. I just didn't know how. Bill Rollins had kept Harris Hawks, and it turned out that Duke had been back intermittently on Bill's land, raising the Hawks, breeding them with the help of some low-life junkies who got to sleep in the house in return. You look as unsettled as I've ever seen you. So, I'm walking through the woods, said Gary. I'm alone. It's early morning, not long after sunrise. I stood on a steel-jawed trap. He raised his pant leg and showed Ren a small white scar about four inches above his ankle. Holy fuck! So that snaps shut, but I don't make a sound. But when the trap closes, it cuts the rope attached to a net above that's filled with freshly killed animals. Small ones. Rabbits and rats and weasels. What the fuck? Down it comes. I'm laying there in the stink of all this crap around me. Rats and weasels and shit sliced open. And then I hear flapping wings. Someone had released a dozen hawks, and down they came. I just lay back and close my eyes, said Gary. I could hear laughter. There's almost hysterical laughter coming from somewhere in the trees. Eventually, I passed out from the pain. Those birds weren't just poking about the rodents. When I woke up, my leg was freed. I managed to limp through the most obvious clearing back toward where I thought the car was. I went the wrong way. I'm guessing whoever released me turned me around so I was facing the opposite way. So I was going the wrong way for quite some time. I came across a hunter. Regular guy. He smiled. He didn't have two horns coming out the top of his head. Duke Rollins. Gary nodded. He showed me where to go. Pointed me in the right direction. He was real nice, real personable. When I got back to the car... The agent I was with was lying there on the ground, naked from the waist down. It was bad. Rollins had raped him. Done so much damage, he wound up needing surgery. He was never the same after that. He lasted another five months, and he killed himself. Jesus Christ. I couldn't help thinking of the last thing Rollins said to me as I walked away. A cell phone started to ring. Gary stood up. Sorry, I need to take this. Ren stood up. What was the last thing he said to you? Boo hoo. Ren left Gary's office and went into the bullpen. Joe was sitting on her desk talking to the group. Rebel briefing. Not arrogant at all. Joe looked up. Rin, maybe you could listen to this, too. Breathe deeply. You saw Rollins' photo, said Joe. He was once a handsome man. He possibly still is. But what you don't see in the old mug shots is that he now has a scar that might make a woman think twice about helping him or accompanying him somewhere. This scar comes from the corner of his mouth and stretches upwards, like it's the continuation of his smile. Oh, 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 fuck! Ren could feel something plunge down through her chest. Scar. Texas. Shaven-headed. Now I know why he was familiar. He's the guy from the bipolar support group. Oh, my God. I have already engaged with Duke Rollins. Chapter 39 In a flawlessly casual move, Ren raised a finger. Could you please excuse me for one moment? 
Thank you. She moved quickly to the ladies' room, retching as she pushed through the outer door, making it into a stall just before she threw up. Oh, dear God. He knows who I am. I had no clue. He didn't seem that fucked up to me. Why not? I have a good radar. What's going on? Oh, Jesus Christ. She gathered herself, went over to the sink, washed her face, washed her hands over and over. She brushed her teeth, reapplied foundation. Duke Rollins. I met Duke Rollins. I can't tell anyone this. They don't know about bipolar support. Oh, I could tell Janine now, but she would worry. Gary is never going to hear this. The rule is you walk in there alone, you walk out alone. Oh, God. I am on Duke Rollins' radar. Ren took a deep breath and walked back into the room where Joe Lucchese was plotting Rollins' downfall. He frowned, went back to talking. If Duke Rollins is the killer, said Joe, then it's likely the woman he's been killing over and over is his mama. Skinny, blonde Wanda Rollins, a former prostitute and junkie. Well, that's not gonna fuck him up one bit, said Ren. And where is Wanda Rollins now? Why doesn't he just go and kill her? He may already have, said Joe. Wanda Rollins disappeared six years ago. Her husband, Vincent Faraday, who married her after she became a born-again Christian, was hauled in about the disappearance, questioned relentlessly. But nothing came of it. It caused quite a stir at the time. He was a pretty famous local country singer. Do you think Faraday was guilty? said Wren. No, said Joe. He loved that woman for God knows what reason. He was a broken man after that. His whole family came apart. I wouldn't be surprised if Rollins framed him. Years back, the DA in Stingers Creek reckoned that Rollins framed his own Uncle Bill for one of the murders. So I can't see him having a problem framing his mama's husband, who he despised. You say family. Does Wanda have any more children? Twin girls, said Joe. Robin and Chloe Faraday. They will be about 26 years old now. Do you know where they live? said Ren. Denison, Texas, last I heard, said Joe. Do they have any relationship with Duke Rollins? said Ren. Highly unlikely, said Joe. Disdain. I love it. And he had a wife, I read said Wren. Samantha Sammy Rollins. Nah, he's done with her, said Joe. Disdain again. I love it even more. He paused. Right, well, I'm sure I've talked enough. I'd like to see what you've got, if that's okay with you. Great. Wren's cell phone started to ring. She looked at the screen. Annie Lowell. Why am I sensing bad news? Excuse me for one second, said Wren. I better take this. She picked up. Oh, Wren, sweetheart. Devin's been hurt. She got hit by a car. She was taking Misty for a walk. The driver didn't stop. Oh, my God. Is she all right? She's conscious. She's talking. She's got a broken leg, said Annie. It happened just this afternoon. I've been on the phone with her mother. The whole family is at the hospital. I don't believe it, said Wren. And the driver didn't stop? No, said Annie. And is Misty all right, said Wren. I've got Misty, don't worry. Not a scratch on her. She ran to the nearest house, barked her heart out, and the driver just drove away. Can you imagine? That's terrible, said Wren. How are you doing? Well, 
I'm very upset," said Annie. "Devon's like a granddaughter to me." "Oh, Annie, what can I do to help? Should I go to the hospital?" "No, no, not today. They know you're busy, Ren. I think they'd prefer if you were working on that terrible case of yours. To be honest, they're very selfless people." They knew you'd be worried. They said, "Wait until you have an hour off some evening, and maybe stop by if she's still at the hospital, or stop by the house." I'm okay to look after Misty here, but I can't walk her for any length. Obviously. No, no, don't worry about that," said Ren. "Janine or I will swing by to do that." Thank you so much, Annie. That's such awful news. I'll make sure I talk to Denver PD about what we can do to find out who did this. You take care of yourself, sweetheart, and I'll see you soon. You too, Annie. I'll text Devin, but send my love if you're talking to her. Ren went into the bullpen and let Janine know about the accident. We'll stop by after work. Might be a bit soon," said Janine. "No," said Ren. "She'll be happy to have visitors. She could be in pain. We'll cheer her up." "Okay," said Janine. "You go ahead and see Joe Lacazy. He's in the kitchen. I think he's getting antsy. I can call Glenn Buddy about Devon." "Thank you." Chapter Forty. Ren found Joe Lacazy in the kitchen with Everett. Okay," said Ren. "Are you ready?" Joe nodded. "Sure. I'll take this with me. That's my coffee mug. But I don't really need you to go through everything with me," said Joe. "Of course not. Why would you?" "If you're sure," said Ren. "Why don't you leave everything with me?" I can go through it at my own pace. Take a look around the conference room, what you've got up there on the walls. Well, how about you start off in the interview room for round one? Would that be weird? We're tight on space. The only other option is one of two cells. She smiled. He didn't. Anyway, when you're done, do join me in the conference room. Okay. Ren left Joe in the interview room with a stack of files. She bumped into Everett in the hallway on her way back. I had to put him in one of the interview rooms," said Ren. "He probably thinks it's some kind of FBI mindfuck." "I would too," said Everett. "It's a desk, a chair, four walls," said Ren. "Yes, teeny window, but teeny windows are better than none." "I want the conference room." Or at least the freedom to wander freely in and out of it. She leaned in. He's very intense. I need some space. I like him," said Everett. "Hey, I'm not saying I don't." She paused. As an aside, Gary could be losing it. We're in his office. This cell phone rings, and he says, totally spaced out, "I need to take this." His phone was on the desk. The phone ringing was clearly next door or somewhere. Could he have Alzheimer's? Do you think? No. Goodbye. Ren went to her desk and looked at her notebook where she'd been taking notes when Joe was talking. She Googled Wanda Rollins's disappearance. She saw photos of her husband Vincent Faraday. He had once been a very handsome, plump, well-groomed man. He had warm blue eyes, a thick head of gray hair, and a thick mustache. Ren called the agent who had interviewed Faraday at the time of his wife's disappearance. She got him to email the video and went into the AV room to watch it. Sorry, Joe, you could have had the conference room after all. Ren hit play and got the inside of an interview room in the FBI field office in Sherman, Texas. The camera was clearly mounted in the corner of the ceiling, giving an aerial view of Vincent Faraday, 
who looked like he had all but disintegrated since his wife's disappearance, or maybe since he had the misfortune of marrying her. These things happen, Agent Richmond was saying. You marry one woman, she turns into a whole nother one. You married a reformed woman, Mr. Faraday. Wanda Rollins had cleaned up her act for you. You had sixteen good years with her. She gave you two beautiful daughters. So, when she was back using, you must have figured, she doesn't care anymore. She mustn't love us anymore if she can start shooting up again. No, sir, said Vincent. I understand that addiction can take a powerful hold on a person. It doesn't make them weak, and it doesn't make me weak to get frustrated by that, or the girls were getting hurt and angry about it. What about your daughters? said Richmond. Should we be worried about them? Vincent Faraday shifted forward in his seat, created a 45-degree angle between himself and Richmond. Now, what do you mean by that, Agent? Your daughter Chloe, said Richmond. She's been in some trouble. That's a low blow, said Vincent. She was just 16 years old. We've spoken with the school and with some of the parents. She does appear to have anger management problems. There was a whole lot of nothing, said Vincent. That's not the conclusion Denison P.D. came to, said Richmond. Well, with respect, that's their business, said Vincent. I believe Chloe and my other daughter, Robin. Were you involved in the disappearance of your wife, said Richmond. No, sir, no, I was not, said Vincent. Do you have any knowledge of your wife's whereabouts? said Richmond. No, sir. No, I do not, said Vincent. We have a statement here from one of your neighbors who said that you told him, quote, I'm about a breaking point. We're living in a kind of hell. I think we'd all be better off if Wanda was gone. There's nothing more I can do for her. Vincent nodded. And that's the God's honest truth. I said exactly those words and I understand that they don't sound too good. I'd tell the police the same thing, if it would my neighbor said them. There wasn't a word of a lie in what I said. Didn't mean I thought that killing her was an option. Hell, I can't even kill a spider. My daughters will tell you that. His eyes welled up. I understand you have to do this. But can you please consider what it's doing to my girls? Their mother's gone. She's been gone years. Please don't take their father away from them, too. Isn't it true that you haven't spoken to either of your daughters in six years? Said Richmond. Low blow again. Faraday nodded, wiped away tears. They blame me for their mama going off the rails and they blame me for falling apart afterwards, for abandoning them. But I know one thing. They know I would never have hurt a hair on that woman's head. We can't choose who we love. I've written enough songs about it to know that. Songs? Songs? Holy shit! Chapter 41 Ren googled Vincent Faraday's songs, looking for tiny needles and sharps disposal. Nothing. Children, though. Children. It could be one of his daughters, Robin or Chloe. Ren called Richmond from the Sherman field office. Richmond, it's Ren Bryce here from Safe Streets in Denver, I watched the tapes. Thank you. What can you tell me about Robin and Chloe Faraday? Robin Faraday emigrated to London four years ago. Got married over there. Has a three-year-old daughter. She calls me up every now and then to see if I have any update on her mother. 
She seems like a real honorable young lady. She was heartbroken about what happened to her mother, even though she was treated badly by her. But she's still her mother. That's the way she looks at it. And Chloe Faraday, said Wren. I saw in the video that she was the wild one. She was, said Richmond. And that's pretty much my last update on her. I've no idea. She was back in Denison last year, but a call into Denison PD about some stolen property she wanted to get back from her father. A whole lot of nothing. I don't know where she came from or where she went back to. Let me put a call into my buddy in Denison PD. I'll get back to you. Thanks, said Wren. I appreciate it. Wren stuck her head back into the interview room to Joe two hours later. Do you want to come into the conference room? She said. Sure, he said, standing up, stretching his legs. It's not very comfortable, I know, said Wren. I'm really sorry about that. It's not normally like this. No, I get it, said Joe. Hmm. They sat at the conference room table. Joe Lucchese seemed to fill every space he entered. He put down the photo of Kurt Vine. I'm not buying this loser as Rollins' as accomplice, first of all. Why not, said Wren. Are you, said Joe. Not so much. I'm keeping an open mind on it for now. I can't see how a fat gamer sitting on his fat ass half the time could be of any use to a guy like Rollins. You mentioned a girl he used in Ireland. She was heavy set, vulnerable, insecure, said Wren. Is this just more of the same? Joe paused. Well, she was willing to go out, be active on his behalf. Kurt Vine went out, too. He brought that lady to the hospital. But he stumbled across that scene, said Joe. And what was in it for him? Nothing. We don't know that. Then he was just doing a kindness, meaning he's hardly the type to be out raping and murdering women. Maybe he was targeting Amanda Petrie. And remember, Rollins has been changing his approach here to fuck with us. Joe's face was set. Did you read about the $10,000 wired into Vine's account? Said Wren. Joe nodded. Yeah. I can't make a call on that until I know more. I understand that. She paused. I'm not saying Vine was his accomplice for the commission of the rapes and murders, but for another reason. And not just as a fall guy. See, I don't think Duke Rollins thought he would need a fall guy when he started out. I think that was part of an evolving plan. I think it goes beyond Vine having that remote property. There are other remote properties in Colorado. Rollins could have broken into one. He could have rented one anonymously or gotten his accomplice, if he has one, to rent one. Kurt Vine's photographs are about abandonment. Duke Rollins' life is about abandonment. It could just be that. Or something else that made Kurt Vine his target. Well, even if this loser Vine was his accomplice, he's dead now. And he will be replaced. I don't think it makes much of a difference. Duke Rollins will always have an accomplice. Pew! Shut down! Joe checked the time. I'm running late, he said. I'll take you where you need to be, said Wren. That's not a problem. Really? That would be great. Would you mind swinging by the hotel? My kids will be waiting. The nanny is the night off. Sean is taking care of Grace. He wouldn't call her the nanny if he was sleeping with her. Sure, said Wren. Why am I thinking about who he's sleeping with? They drove through the evening traffic. Duke Rollins saw it as a mistake not to have killed Anna when he had the chance, said Joe. Whoa, what have you been thinking? 
He wanted me to feel the pain of being responsible for her death. She didn't die, but she was attacked. She was traumatized. I'm still responsible. I didn't protect her from him. That's not true, said Ren. From what I read, it was complicated. She turned to him. Why did you think that he was able to leave that behind, leave things unfinished, that he didn't come back after Ireland? He would have had a hard time getting close to her, said Joe. You were right before. We were all hypervigilant. Anna was depressed. She barely went outside the door. She just about managed to work from home. She became a recluse, almost. If she went outside, she risked having panic attacks. Hmm. Depressed does not equal hypervigilant in my experience. But you still went to work, said Ren. She was alone. He just wouldn't have had the balls, said Joe. He's a sick fuck, but he wanted to be a free sick fuck. Maybe something else stopped him from coming back to kill Anna, said Ren. Like what? said Joe. Stop talking. Stop talking. Grace, said Ren. Maybe Anna's pregnancy changed something. Like he didn't want to kill a pregnant woman, said Joe. Maybe pregnancy repels a man who hates his mama. Or maybe he wanted her to carry her baby to term so he could wait, wait to take them both away, your wife and your child. Then, when Anna died, he needed you to develop that bond with Grace and take her from you when she was older. He just wants to keep causing you more pain. Take away your little girl, your little Anna, the only physical link left. What are you thinking? said Joe. Nothing, said Ren. You need to tell me if you have a theory, said Joe. I don't. I'm... Processing. I presume you've taken steps to keep your family safe. Joe had drifted somewhere deep and dark. He zoned back in. Camille is not just a nanny. She's trained. Jesus Christ. And Sean's big enough and bold enough, said Joe. He boxes. Oh, so do I, said Wren. Maybe we could spar sometime. Joe raised his eyebrows. What? said Wren. He'd be too embarrassed to fight an old lady? I'd beat the shit out of him without thinking twice. Joe laughed. Wow, he laughs. Sean's a good kid, said Joe. He turned out well. It was touch and go for a while. He's been through a lot. He went off the rails in his teens when we came back from Ireland. He was drinking, in with the wrong crowd. We were arguing all the time. Then he just got his shit together. When we lost Anna, it was like a switch went on in his brain. Something changed in him. And Grace was a big part of that. He was crazy about her. This little baby who only had us. And he saw life in a different way, I guess. I'm sure you were a big part of him getting his shit together, too, said Ren. I don't know, said Joe. Do you have kids? I love kids, but no, said Ren. I just get to observe and make judgments. Sean Lucchese stood up when he saw Ren and Joe coming. He was dark-haired, broad, handsome, all-American, like his dad. Sean, this is Ren Bryce from the FBI, said Joe. Sean shot a glance at his dad, then back at Ren. Hi, he said, shaking her hand firmly, sullen and abrupt. Could use manners. Hi, Ren, said Grace. Hello there, Grace, said Ren. Are you having fun in Denver? She nodded. Yes. Camille and me've been to lots of places. 
Sean's taking me to the movies tonight. Good for you, said Wren. How adorable! Twenty-six-year-old taking his little sister out. Sean picked Grace up and hugged her. Oh, I think your big brother adores you. Okay, let's go get something to eat, said Joe. Wren, would you like to? We're going to eat by the movie theater, said Sean, setting Grace down gently. Well, I thought maybe we could all eat together, said Joe. Nah, you two go ahead, said Sean. You two? What the heck is he getting at? Joe looked embarrassed. He bent down and kissed Grace on the head. Love you, sweetheart. You have fun. Popcorn only for her, Sean. No candy. Sorry, sweetheart. She flung her arms around his legs. Love you, love you, love you, Daddy. Joe beamed. Love you way more. I'd love to stay for dinner, said Ren, but I'm gonna have to get back home. You guys eat together. I'll see you tomorrow at the office. Are you sure? Said Joe. Absolutely. She had a sudden flash of Grace Lucchese, Camille, and the black shadow of Duke Rollins behind them. Why did Joe take them along? It's nuts. Ren left them tired and drained. Janine had sent her a text. Think we'll give Devin some time to rest. Ren texted back. Okay, I'll go see Annie and Wonder Dog Misty instead. Smiley face. Annie was thrilled to see her, and Ren quickly felt at home and cozy and loved. Misty nearly passed out with the excitement. Ren sat with Annie, drinking tea and chatting about her travels. The doorbell rang. Let me get that, said Ren. You stay where you are. It was Devin's ten-year-old brother holding a squishy package wrapped in white plastic. Ren opened the door. Hey there, Jack. Come in. How's Devin doing? Hey, Ren. Mom saw your car. Told me to come over. She says she's sorry she's too tired. Devin's doing just fine, thank you. He beamed the family smile. Wide and extra curled up at the edges. That's good to hear, said Ren. He held out the package. Mom said to give you this, and that she's really sorry. Ren frowned. About what? Thanks, said Jack. Bye. He turned and ran. Thanks, Jack, said Ren. Tell your mom thanks. She opened the package. She recognized her black marmot rain jacket. It was folded up with an envelope on top. She put the envelope aside and shook out the jacket. It was shredded in three places. What happened here? She opened the envelope. It was a hundred dollar store voucher for REI. What the what? Ren called Devin's mom. It's Ren, Liz. What's this voucher about? Oh, hi, Ren. Did Jack not explain? Devin was wearing your jacket the day of the accident. The one she borrowed a while back. That's a good jacket, Ren. I hope you can replace it. Liz, you shouldn't have. Poor Dev. I hope she wasn't worrying about my jacket in the middle of all this. I can't accept this. I'm afraid you have no choice, said Liz. Do you have any word on the driver? No, said Wren, nothing. Unfortunately, there are a lot of kids joyriding and fleeing the scenes of accidents. It's terrible, said Liz. She paused. I just want to say thank you for everything you do for Devin. She loves you. You're the big sister she never had. Wren laughed. Well... We have been mistaken for sisters at the park a few times, which I take as a huge compliment. Really, it's just the long, dark hair. A shiver ran down Ren's spine. Oh, my God. This wasn't an accident at all. 
This was deliberate. She was wearing my jacket. Someone thought Devin was me. Chapter 42 He was a hunter. He understood camouflage. When he stepped out of the car, he looked like all the other regular men who parked here, got out of their cars and went through their stretches. It was a very nice neighborhood, and he made sure that he looked like a very nice man. He watched as she set out on her run. She was fit mom pretty. It was clear she looked after herself. She wouldn't be doing this at 8 a.m. if she didn't. High, blonde ponytail, swishing back and forth, swimmer's shoulders, tan skin, sweet, tight ass. He bet her husband slammed that every night. Most men would love a chance at that ass. He began to run behind her. Though she was fit, he could tell that her heart wasn't in it. Her shoulders were a little too low. She wasn't raising her knees very high. She could trip if she wasn't careful. Just as he said it, she fell. He was amazed. He felt a surge of power. He heard her say to herself out loud, Seriously? Seriously, you've got to be kidding me. He looked around. There was no one in sight, not one person. He crouched down beside her. Are you okay? He reached out a gloved hand. She looked up, tears in her eyes. She grabbed his hand and let him pull her up. Oh, she said. I don't think the gods are smiling down on me at the moment. She wiped her tears away. Thank you. Thanks. Is anything broken? He said. No, she said. Just a little sprain and a grazed knee. I'll live to fight another day. Thanks again. She was nodding her dismissal. He just stared at her. There was a tiny flicker on her face. Karen, he said. She tried to withdraw her hand. He wouldn't let her. Karen Deadling, he said. He reached into his pocket. Your husband and I go back a long way. Chapter 43 Ran went into Safe Streets at 8 a.m. and called Glenn Buddy. It's Ran. Did you get anything on that hit-em-run driver? Nada, said Glenn. Not yet. She was wearing my jacket at the time, Glenn. She has the same dark, shoulder-length hair. She was walking misty on the street where I used to live. You heard Joe Lucchese. Rollins is targeting law enforcement. I'm worried this was meant for me. If Rollins was working on old information on where I live... Sounds to me like Rollins is not the type to leave a job unfinished, said Glenn. That's my concern, said Wren. What if he comes back again? Devin is only... Wren, my dear, if he comes back again, it'll be you he targets. And he won't miss, so relax. Thanks, Glenn. Thanks for that. Joe Lucchese appeared in the bullpen. Morning, he said. Hey, said Wren. Did you enjoy your evening? Yes, said Joe. I went to the movie in the end. Took my mind off everything for a couple hours. I bet it didn't take your mind off anything, said Wren. Joe paused, then nodded. No, you're right. He walked out of the room. Wren looked at Everett. He's a cheery fellow. She went to the kitchen to make coffee. Gary was standing at the machine. She told him about Devin. That's not Rollins' style. You know it isn't. I hope it isn't, said Wren. But what if he's targeting people who mean something to people? I don't have kids or close family in Denver. This is a hit and run said Gary. Nothing more exciting than that. He poured her coffee. So, he said. 
What do you make of Joe Lucchese? He's intense, said Wren. Abrupt. But very good. He's cold, though. He's had a hard time of it, said Gary. I'm guessing he had a very different pre-Duke Rollins life. It's so depressing. That is exactly why you cannot, under any circumstances, personally engage Duke Rollins if you don't have to. Of course I have to. It's irrefucking existable not to. It's Duke Rollins, for fuck's sake. It's the greatest psycho on Earth. Gary's cell phone started to ring. It's Claire, he said. I better take it. Ran went into the bullpen. By the time she sat down at her desk, Gary was calling her to come to his office. When she walked in, he was ghostly. Karen didn't come back from her run this morning, he said. Oh, fuck. I've no way of contacting her because she doesn't carry her cell when she runs. She lost her armband. I'm sure it's nothing, said Wren. She probably met a friend, got stuck into a conversation, lost track of time. It happens. He looked at her like he wanted to believe her. They stared at each other. Wren wondered if they were thinking the same thing. Duke Rollins. Then Wren wondered if they shared the same follow-up thought. What if Karen's found out about the affair? Because if we put out a B.O.L.O. for Karen Detling, and it turns out she's running away from her cheating FBI agent husband in the middle of a serial killer investigation, well. Where does she normally go running? said Wren. Can we go check wherever that is? I'll call around her friends, said Gary. When cheating attacks. Fifteen minutes later, Gary called Ren and Joe into his office. That was her, he said. I got hold of her. She's okay. She's fine. His voice cracked. Oh, thank God, said Ren. Joe was perplexed. Gary explained what had happened. Safe to explain to him, now you know it wasn't your cheating that caused this. It's not good, guys. It's Duke Rollins. What? said Joe. What? Gary let out a breath, struggled to compose himself. Take your time, said Wren. Karen was running in the park, said Gary. She fell, and this guy who had been running behind her stopped and helped her up. She said he seemed like a regular guy, but then he called her Karen, said he and her husband went a long way back. Then he gave her an envelope and ran back to wherever he came from. When he was gone, she looked at it. And it had your name on it. He pointed to Joe. My name, said Joe. What the fuck, said Wren. Where is it? I'm going home now to get it, said Gary. I told her to put it into a paper bag. Joe was stunned. Is your wife okay? She's very shaken, said Gary, but she'll be fine. She's made of strong stuff. Not from what I saw. He didn't hurt her, said Joe. No, said Gary. There was a short silence. Are we all thinking how Anna Lucchese was not so fortunate? Is there anything I can do? said Wren. Yeah, said Joe. No, said Gary. Thank you both. I'll check on things at home. Bring you back the letter. Chapter 44 Gary arrived back within the hour and handed Joe the envelope from Duke Rollins. Joe opened it with a gloved hand and looked inside. There was a second envelope with a single sheet of paper in it. He pulled it out. He looked up, confused. What is it? Well, that's my wife's signature, said Joe. It's a FedEx shipment slip, dated like seven years ago. 
Why is Duke Rollins sending me this? Wren handed him two evidence bags. He put the slip inside one, and the envelope inside the other. Does it say what she was signing for? said Wren. No, said Joe. It was after we came back from Ireland. Anna was working from home most of the time. She was always getting deliveries to the House of Interior Things. I don't know why this one matters. Ran read the slip. I would venture this is just his way of fucking with you. Just his way of letting you know he went through your garbage once. Or got into your house. Joe shook his head. There is no way he could have gotten into my house. Anna was on high alert. She knew what he looked like, obviously. She wouldn't have opened the door to him. If he was in a FedEx uniform with a baseball cap pulled down over his eyes, said Wren. That would have looked weird to her, said Joe. She wouldn't have fallen for that. Wren handed the slip to Everett. I'll see if I can get anything else on this, he said. Oh, fuck. Is it... Could it be his way of letting you know if he got that close before, he could do it again? Like now, with Grace? I'd like to see him try, said Joe. What's security like at your hotel? said Everett. Tight, said Joe. But it's a hotel. There are ways and means, but, like I said, I'm not so worried about him coming after me there. Really? There are three options, said Wren. We track Duke Rollins down, Duke Rollins comes our way, or... Wren locked eyes with Joe. Or we draw him our way. I know you know what I'm thinking. There is just one option, said Gary. We track the motherfucker down. We need to work out where his head is at, said Wren. Who are the people who might still be significant in his life, for better or worse? We have his mother's husband, Vincent Faraday, who he no doubt despises. I'm sure he feels the same way about the Faraday twins, Chloe and Robin. We have Rollins' ex-wife, Samantha Sammy Rollins, we have Jeff Riggs, father of Donald Riggs. The Riggs family is hugely significant to Duke Rollins' life, said Joe. They were very close. The Riggs' house was a refuge for Rollins in many ways, which, when you consider that Jeff Riggs was a hardcore alcoholic, is quite something. I don't know if Rollins would still consider it a safe place to go if he was in trouble, but I do know that he has gone back to visit Jeff Riggs in the past. Wren went into the bullpen. Janine was sitting at her desk, doing her frowny staring at the screen. Wren filled her in on Karen and the letter for Joe Lucchese. That is bizarre, said Janine. I know. I'm scheduling a few things for tomorrow, said Wren. Am I right in saying you have a day off? Yes, said Janine. A most welcome one. Have you plans? I do. I'm eating Terry for lunch. We might do a little shopping. Nothing crazy. Nothing crazy. Wren's cell phone rang. She picked up. Agent Brass, it's Agent Richmond here in Sherman, Texas. What I can tell you about Chloe Faraday is that her last known job was as a nurse. That was two years ago. Apparently, she has also worked in an informal capacity as a carer. And that's it. I'm not picking her up anywhere in the past two years. You might want to talk to Vincent Faraday. He could know more. Oh, my God. Nurse. Sharp's disposal. Okay, said Wren. Thank you for the call. Wren went back into Gary's office. Joe was still there. Joe, how would you feel about a trip to Texas? Chapter 45 Vincent Faraday's home was a disintegrating cabin 
in the woods outside Denison, Texas. Within its walls, his body was doing the same thing, and within that, his mind. Ren and Joe sat across from him, waiting. Waiting for sense. There was a half-empty bottle of whiskey and a smeared glass on a table beside him. He knocked back what was left in it. Ren took the time to look around the room. There were photos of Wanda still on the sideboard, looking respectable and happy, and many photos of their twin girls, only up until they were about 16 years old. All three, skinny, blonde, the girls, identical. He came from nowhere, said Vincent suddenly. He poured himself another glass. Wanda turned her life around, found me, found God, had the girls, her beautiful twins. She was a different woman. Then I came home one day, and there she was, a needle in her arm. It went on like that for a little while. I tried to hide it from the girls, but I couldn't. She turned into an absolute wreck. Became so mean and nasty. I didn't know who she was. Then, one day, I came home. She was gone. No warning. And you didn't report her missing at that time, said Wren. No, ma'am, said Vincent. Because it would have been a waste of police time. She could have been anywhere. I told our friends, my family, that she was in rehab. I told the girls the same thing. Everyone had seen Wanda. They knew what was going on. At that stage, though, the girls hated her. It was so sad. Their whole lives, they thought the sun shone from their mama. He drifted off. And so did I. I began drinking. We all have our painkillers, I guess. He shifted in his seat. And then the police show up a few years ago. Some D.A. who was looking for glory decides to try and arrest me for murdering my wife, even though they haven't even got a body. My life's been hell these last few years, said Vincent. Absolute hell. He drained his glass. I was interviewed for hours and hours, over 20 times by Denison P.D., then by the FBI and Sherman. Imagine constantly being hauled in to go through the same questions over and over. It's enough to drive you insane. You know the truth. You know your wife just upped and left. You're thinking, did she die? Did she kill herself? Did she drown by accident? Was she hit by a car somewhere? Is she lying in a ditch? Did she walk into the path of a killer? It's been a nightmare from the moment she stuck that needle in her vein. I've been a performer all my life. But then people started looking at me to see if I was still performing, covering up a crime. Ren and Joe hovered without a word in Vincent Faraday's anguish. Vincent shook his head, poured himself another whiskey. I've had kids egg my house. Spray paint murderer on my wall, said Vincent. I've had people knock on my door under all kinds of pretenses. Oh, they're studying justice or law or forensic something or other. One of them was all the way from New York by the sound of him, looking for information about Duke Rollins, about what kind of childhood he might have had, what kind of mother Wanda was to him. I told him I didn't know that Wanda Rollins, and I sure don't want to hear another thing about that animal Rollins. He paused. You know, Wanda had a tattoo of that boy's face on her shoulder. Must have gotten it in one of her guiltier, drunker moments, way before we met. She always wanted to get it taken off, but was afraid it would hurt. 
His gaze drifted away. Then he returned to his story. So I answered what I could for the young man. He seemed well-intentioned, like he wanted to set a record set straight. He seemed to me to be invested in the truth, unlike most people. He paused. And I know what you're thinking. You could say to me, don't open your door. But the truth is, I think to myself, what if it's Wanda coming home? Love is the mystery to end all mysteries. So, there you have it, said Vincent. His eyes were filled with pain, with sadness, with resignation. Yet no anger. We know that your daughter Robin is living in London now, said Wren. But we can't seem to find Chloe. He looked up at her. Vacant eyed. He took another drink. Do you have any idea where your daughter Chloe is now, Mr. Faraday? said Joe. He shook his head. I don't. I do not. He narrowed his eyes. Have I met you before, Detective? His words were getting slurred. Ren looked at Joe. No, sir said Joe. Something about you is familiar, said Vincent. Joe shook his head. I can't help you there. Have you seen Chloe in the past while, Mr. Faraday? said Ren, guiding him back while he could still at least partially function. He nodded. She came around here looking for her guitar about twelve months back. Arrived with the police, said I stole it, which I hadn't. I couldn't bear to look at it, said Vincent. I put it in the attic. I told her she could go on up and get it. Told her she could stay if she liked. What she replied to that wasn't very nice at all. God love this man. Is Chloe a singer? said Wren. Yes, said Vincent. A very good one. Does she write songs? said Wren. Oh, yes, said Vincent. She was writing songs from when she was eight years old. Do you or your family or Wanda's family have any connections in Denver? said Joe. Not that I know of, said Vincent. Denver. Denver. He let out a breath. Got an old roadie buddy there, guy by the name of Benny Jakes. Good guy, Benny. Wren texted Everett. Everything you got on Benny Jakes, roadie, based in Denver. I want you to know Wanda loved those girls very, very much, said Vincent. I can't for the life of me see how it could have gone so wrong. They all descended into silence, and before long, Vincent Faraday was snoring in his chair. Do you mind if we take a look around? said Wren. Don't mind if we do, said Joe. He raised his eyebrows. Wren and Joe weaved in and out of the rooms in the house. Vincent Faraday had clearly downsized. Two of the rooms were filled with packing boxes, packed by a removals company. Living room, kitchen, Chloe's room, Robin's room. Ren went into the kitchen, opened the drawers, got a knife, came back in, sliced open some of the boxes. One of them was filled with bubble-wrapped posters behind glass and framed in black. She opened the first view. They were advertising appearances by Vincent Faraday country star in different venues across Texas. There were three photo albums wrapped in brown paper. Ren opened one of them and flicked through photos of a very handsome Vincent Faraday on stage with his fans, at radio interviews, at press appearances. He had a big, friendly smile, radiated warmth and happiness. 
she went through all the albums. The last one was a personal one, the most recent, and featured a clean and shiny Wanda Rollins, their marriage, and soon afterwards, Chloe and Robin. They were pretty girls. And now they were gone. Ren opened another box. It was filled with girly notebooks. Journals? Ren picked one up and flicked through it. On the inside cover it said, This belongs to Chloe Faraday. She took all the notebooks that had Chloe Faraday's name inside. Ren met with Joe in the kitchen. Could Duke Rollins be looking for Wanda? said Ren. Could he use Chloe Faraday for that? Like bait? I don't know, said Joe. I can't get a handle on this. What we've got is this song that sounds like Chloe Faraday's life, said Wren, and links her to Jane Doe and Carrie Longman. Vincent stirred in the chair as Wren and Joe came back in and sat down. Joe leaned into him, spoke gently. Mr. Faraday, have your daughters ever met Duke Rollins? Hell no, said Vincent. They don't even know he exists. They never knew Wanda's maiden name. None of that. Wanda Rollins had the type of slate anyone would want to wipe clean. Junky hooker mom of a serial killer son. Chapter 46 Ren called Gary on the drive to the airport and filled him in. So, said Ren, depending on the relationship, if there is any, between Duke Rollins and Chloe Faraday, he could have access to an apartment in Denver owned by a man called Benny Jakes. Everett is checking that out. When Ren and Joe arrived at Dallas Airport, they found out their flight was delayed. They sat in the airport lounge and ordered a round, and then another. After another round, Joe was getting a little drunker than Wren. You're on something else. Painkillers. Something. Meds, meds everywhere. I won't lie, said Joe, leaning forward. But if I lay eyes on Duke Rollins, I will kill him. Finally, he admits it. You won't, said Wren. Joe raised his eyebrows. You've got a six-year-old daughter, said Wren. You won't. Joe looked away, pressed his fingers into his jaw, like a doctor checking for pain. You know that if you kill him, you lose, said Wren. I know you know that. However, you will win if he is jailed, she paused and ass-raped on a loop. Joe was momentarily quiet, then burst out laughing. I thought you were going to say something honorable. But ass-raped on a loop, he nodded. I can get on board with that. Ren took her chance. Joe, could you please take Grace away from Denver? Totally away, somewhere no one knows about. Only you and Camille. I didn't tell Gary, but I think Duke has targeted me. Someone close to me was in an accident, and I think I was the intended target. Then how close he got to Karen Detling. For you, I just don't think it's a risk worth taking. He didn't reply. As they got steadily drunker, he got more maudlin. Anna dying in childbirth, said Joe, which I didn't think was even possible these days. It was just so shocking. Duke Rollins had physically damaged her so badly, her body couldn't hold up. She had wounds to the kidney, the bowel, scar tissue. I can't tell you the hell I would like to see that man go to. Grace saved my life. 
she saved my life. It was right there when she was born. As soon as I held her in my arms, I fell in love with the most perfect little human being I had ever seen. As your wife lay dying, Jesus Christ. Joe laughed. Don't get me wrong. I love my son. But he's a young man now. He doesn't need me. And I screwed him up along the way. He's been through a lot. Everyone who comes near me goes through a lot. You're carrying around way too much guilt, said Ren. Though I would be no different. It's like on that one day, ten years ago, boom! Shots fired, Donald Riggs goes down, and the course of my entire life has changed, said Joe. He stared into her eyes. She could feel her heart rate accelerate. Uh-oh. I've been watching you, said Joe. Uh-oh. I don't want you to be me. Phew, I won't be. Not a chance. You're thinking you won't be, said Joe. I used to think the same when I looked around at the guys at work. I wouldn't be the divorced one, the drinking one, the lonely one, the bitter one, the cheating one, the damaged one. So, I didn't cheat. I didn't divorce. Where does that leave me? One of the lucky ones? He paused. Do you have a good life? Um, yes. Do you have a good man in your life? Said Joe. Pause. Yes. Why the pause? Treasure it, said Joe. Look after yourselves. It might not always be there. He stood up. It's a flight. Ren watched him leave the bar. Oh, God. I do not want to be you. Joe slept through the entire flight. By the time they reached Denver, Ren wrote a text to Ben. This NYPD guy has sucked the lifeblood out of me. She reread it. That's pretty shitty. She deleted it. She sent a new one. I love you. We are lucky. Kiss, kiss. Now, let's not fuck it up. And when I say us, I mean me. Ben replied with a photo. It was him sitting on her sofa with a beer. And, surprise. No way, she replied. Can't make you out. Too many clothes in way. Chapter 47 Ben welcomed her straight to bed when she got home. You are too good, she said afterwards. I almost can't handle it. It's overwhelming. Ben laughed. I'm not sure you're old or obese enough to have a heart attack. I'm not so sure. Why do I feel so overwhelmed? She rolled over on her side, out from under his arm, and got up. Aren't you staying in bed? Killer's gonna kill. A few hours won't make a difference. You know lots of things, Ben Rader, but that you do not. She leaned down and kissed him. Grabbing my tits is only gonna make this harder for both of us. She paused. Don't even say it. Don't show that to me. God damn it. Ren sat on the sofa with Chloe Faraday's notebooks open around her. They seemed to span her high school years, sophomore to senior, and one more after that. They were part journal, part creative writing, part music manuscript. They were unsurprising threads of darkness through all of it, along with drawings of pretty girls and pretty things. I can relate. Chloe was fervently anti-drugs, had been a leader in the Say No campaign, designed posters for it, given speeches. Hey, said Ben, walking into the living room. 
Bren glanced at the clock. 4 a.m. You need to get some rest, said Ben. I can't. I'm in the middle of this. She paused, her hands resting on the open notebook. You won't be able to think straight if you don't rest, said Ben. That's bullshit, said Ren. You know that. And I'm thinking very straight. Your sleep is all over the place. It's not. I'm not trying to interfere. Yet here you are. Come on, said Ben. Okay, look, if I can just keep working here, then I'll be able to come to bed quicker. It's 4 a.m. Who gives a fuck? You need to look after your health. She narrowed her eyes. Health? I'm sitting here with eight notebooks to get through, trying to fucking absorb all this shit, trying to... to... I mean, fuck. This woman... She stabbed the photo of Hope Coulson. Delivered food to lonely fucking old people, and she gets raped and murdered. This woman was in her garden in the sunshine, hanging out her fucking watching. No, fuck this, Ben. The world has gone to shit. It has gone to shit. And I'm trying to play my part in shoveling it off the side of the fucking earth, down into the burning center of hell. I don't care, wherever. The idea that the city is filled with potential victims is traumatizing me. Ren, Ren, calm down, said Ben. Calm down. I want to hurt you. You are not my shrink, said Ren. Well, where is your shrink is what I want to know, said Ben. Asleep. Where else would he be? Or in a psychiatric unit helping people who really need help. She paused. Why are you looking at me like that? What's your point? Ben sat down. Why are you sitting down? Why are you breathing? Ben looked pale. Ren, he said, his tone gentle. Do I have your permission to call Dr. Lone? What the fuck? Are you high? Are you out of your mind? Do you know what you'd sound like to him if you called him up about me? You'd sound like dictionary definition first world problem. You'd sound like a spoiled brat whose girlfriend is giving him a pain in his ass. Dr. Lone would be like, I'm dealing with suicidal, psychotic, violent, sexually deviant, crazy people, and you're calling me about your FBI agent girlfriend. And you're an FBI agent yourself. He'd be like, get a fucking grip. Ren. I'm not having this conversation. I have work to do. And if you stand in the way of that... Ben walked quietly out of the room. Ren got up and walked after him. I can't stand this, she said. I just want to go to bed, said Ben. Well, I want to talk to you, said Ren. I thought you wanted to work. Well, you've ruined that now. Ren, go back to work. No, I want to talk about this. It's late. I'm exhausted. So are you. I can't deal with this, said Ren. You monitoring me like this. Well, go then, said Ben. Just go. You don't think I'll leave, said Ren. You never do. Men never think you're going to leave until you do. And you know what? Do not finish that sentence or you can never come back from it. What? Said Ben. I always do. I always leave. What? Said Ben. Finish that sentence. No way. Nothing, said Ren. Nothing. I just want to work. Yeah, go ahead. Stay healthy. What the fuck is that supposed to mean? Nothing. Nothing. Grow the fuck up, said Ren. I leave in the morning. I'd rather not leave like this. Okay. I'll come in and we can fuck. Then I can get back to this. He hovered in the doorway. She turned around to him, waiting for an answer. How does that sound? She said. I'm tired. I'm just going to go back to sleep. Maybe we can have breakfast together. Okay, said Ren. I am an asshole. Come here. Give me a kiss before you go. The next morning, Ren made French toast, bacon, fruit salad, fresh juice, and coffee. Ben arrived in the kitchen at 7 a.m. Ren was flicking through another of Chloe's notebooks. 
don't mention sleep. Wow, he said. This looks great. So do you. And so did my refrigerator when I opened it. Well, I know how we can get around here. He kissed her. Did you get everything you wanted done? Yes. I'm on the verge of something. It's like I have everything I need. I just need to put it all together. The answer is there. The answer as to where you will find Duke Rollins? Why exactly is he here? Why now, at this point in time? He has his sights on Joe Lucchese, who's here for his son's graduation. But I don't think that's all there is to it. You're sexy when you're thinking. He smiled. See what I did there? I'm always sexy. I like that. If it was true, then I'd be exactly like you. Huh. Which one of us is going to throw up first? Sorry about being cranky last night. You have no idea how much energy it takes for me not to explode. You were just tired. I wasn't in the least bit tired. Jesus. Which part of not tired? Come on. Let's go back to bed so we can send you home on a high. Chapter 48 Bren sat in the jeep at a red light with another of Chloe Faraday's notebooks open on the passenger seat beside her. She was flicking through it and stopped when she came to a poster similar in style to one of Vincent Faraday's concert posters, but hand-drawn by Chloe. It was a crude self-portrait, framed with lights, but instead of the name Chloe Faraday on the bottom, she had signed it Dainty in fancy teenage cursive. Dainty. Just one word. Jonathan Breyer. The girl. The threesome. Her name was Day-something. Not Daisy, but Dainty. Ren's cell phone rang. My dear Everett. Hey there, Renaldino. How was TX? It was XXL fun. That was an L at the end, right? Why, of course. So, I was calling you to give you a little sum sum. I think that's a euphemism for sex, but go ahead. I followed up on your text on the roadie guy, and I have an address in Denver. I'm emailing it now. Anything on him? No priors. Nothing shady. Respectable man. Retired. 68 years old. Seems to spend his time in libraries and at readings. Cultural stuff. Music stuff. Nothing weird. Rand checked Everett's email and drove to Benny Jake's apartment building. She parked across the street, sat low in the seat, watching people come and go. Every movement in her peripheral vision was making her twitch. Not good. She checked her watch. It was 9 a.m. Not a good time to be watching for a girl who might sing in bars. She likely wouldn't surface until midday, unless she had another job. Unless she was working as a nurse or a carer. Fifteen minutes later, the door to the apartment building opened. Ren sat up. Yes! She took a photo on her phone. She got out of the jeep, let Chloe walk down the street a short distance, and crossed to meet her. Chloe Faraday? said Wren. Could I talk to you for a minute, please? It's Danny, she said. Nasty, mean, like your mama. And who are you? said Danny. I'm a friend of your father's, said Wren. I'm sorry to be the one to tell you, but he's not a well man. He's got some money he'd like to pass along to you before he dies. Before the lawyers get at it. Dainty looked left and right. She shrugged. What do I have to do? First, I want you to know that there is someone else who is showing an interest in that money and might like a piece of it. I'm wondering... Has he already approached you in any capacity? 
His name is Duke Rollins. She showed Dainty the photo of Duke. Dainty's face lit up. She started laughing. You're all confused. That's my boyfriend. The what now? Your boyfriend? Said Wren. Since when? Like two years. Oh, fuck. And what has he told you his name is? Said Wren. Told me, said Danny. No, his name just is. It's Harris Riggs. Harris Hawks, Donald Riggs. Jesus Christ. Chapter 49 What does this woman know about what Duke Rollins has been doing? Or has she been operating as his accomplice in some way? Fuck. I need backup. Danny, is there somewhere we can sit down and have a chat? Said Wren. She looked around. There's a coffee shop on the corner, said Danny. What about somewhere nice and out in the open? Why don't we go into that park over there? Sit down at that picnic bench. It's a nice day. To tell someone they're sleeping with their half-brother? Sure, said Danny, running her hand through her hair. Little red dots in her elbow crease, bruises on her arms. Wren sat down opposite Danny on the bench and rested her forearms on the table. How did you meet Harris, said Wren. In a bar, said Danny. I was having a hard time. I wasn't in a good place, I guess. I liked to disappear into my music. I was singing one night. He came in. We got to talking. She shrugged. We had a connection. Danny, said Wren. I'm sorry to have to tell you that this man's real name is Duke Rollins. His mother is Wanda Rollins. His mother is your mother, Wanda. Dandy shook her head. What? You're saying Harris is what? My half-brother? She laughed loud. No, he's not. Mama didn't have any other kids. Me and Robin were the only ones. You're talking shit, and I have no idea why. This man's name is not Harris Riggs, said Wren. It's Duke Rollins. Does the name mean anything to you? Danny shook her head again. No. How do you know my father? He hired me to find you and Robin, said Wren. I'm going to show you something to prove to you who Harris really is. She took out her phone and called up the articles on Donnie Riggs from 2004. She turned the screen around to show Danny. This is Donald Riggs, said Wren. He came from Stingers Creek, Texas. Your mother came from Stingers Creek, Texas. You can ask your father. You can ask your father about Duke Rollins. She found photos of Duke and showed them to Danny. She watched her scan his face, add and remove the parts that were familiar to her. Danny Faraday started to shake. The color drained from her face. No, she said. No, you got this all wrong. You got this all wrong. You are a crazy bitch. Danny bent down, resting her forearms on her knees. She looked like she was trying to compose herself or preparing to throw up. In a toss of blonde hair, she straightened up with a knife in her hand. She jumped up and was suddenly beside Wren. What the fuck? Wren slid away from her and stood up. Dainty lunged for her, swiping down hard. Well, fuck you. Wren deflected, throwing Dainty's arm back, sending the knife skittering across the grass. Fuck! Wren shook out her arm. Fuck, that hurt! Danny ran. Wren ran after her. You bitch. 
You will not outrun me. Ren ran. Oh, the beautiful pain, the beautiful pain. She was gaining on Dainty. Stop, shouted Ren. Federal agent, put your hands over your head. Fuck you, lady, said Dainty, still running. Fuck you. Fuck you, said Ren. Don't take me on, bitch. Do not take me on. Ren accelerated. She could feel the pain searing in her calves, her hamstrings, her glutes. She was within feet. She dived. She caught Danny's legs, brought her down hard. Ren rolled, took the fall well, gripped the bony frame of Dainty Faraday. But Dainty bucked, kicked her leg up, pulled another knife from her filthy white cowboy boot. She brought the blade down, aiming for Ren's forearm. Ren turned away, and the knife went into the grass. Two knives? You psycho bitch. She punched Dainty in the face. She punched her again. Dainty kicked out, caught Ren's jaw. Ren grabbed her ankle, spun her away. She reached for her sidearm. Oh, shit. She looked up. She was looking at her sidearm. And Dainty Faraday was on the other side of it. You fucked up, bitch, said Dainty. You haven't a clue what you're talking about. Ran nodded. You need to lower the weapon, Dainty. You need to drop it right now. Dainty stared at her. What is going on in your junk-addled brother-fucking mind? You haven't a clue, lady, said Dainty. Ren's heart was pounding. And that makes you lucky, said Dainty. Want to know why? Because I want to come back and look you in the eye. I want to come back so I can tell you how you've got it all wrong. So I can make sure myself that you know that. I can look you right in the eye. Ren struggled to get up. Dainty threw the gun at her and ran. Ran went over and sat on the bench. That family is like a brand. Rollins Killings, established 19-whatever. Wanda Rollins, face of the operation. Oh, my God. Wanda Rollins. I did a terrible thing. Something terrible brought me here. Vincent Faraday said Wanda Rollins had a tattoo of Duke on her shoulder. The Jane Doe was Wanda Rollins. That night, when she was being brought to the hospital, she tried to burn her son's face off her shoulder because she knew it would connect them. Duke Rollins kept his own mother chained up, tortured, and beaten. Chapter 50 Ren called the Douglas County Sheriff's Office on the drive to Safe Streets. Could I speak with Under Sheriff Rodeo? She said. It's Ren Bryce, Safe Streets. Rodeo came on the line. Hey, Ren. Sorry, Cole, but what the fuck? Ren, excuse me. I could say the same to you. You were handling that Jane Doe in Sedalia, said Ren. And you didn't run her DNA? What? She wasn't entered into the system because if she was, she would have come up as a familial match with her son, Duke fucking Rollins. That was his mama, Rodile. We could have had that connection. Ren, you wouldn't have got the results back by now, even if I had run it. I might have said Ren. Well, not judging by our current backlogs, no, you would not. Still, that's a pretty big thing to overlook. Are you calling me to give me a talk on how to carry out my job, agent? No, I'm just mad. Well, go be mad to someone else about it. Thanks for taking my call. Anytime. Ren called Janine to tell her about what had happened with Danny Faraday. She got her voicemail. Call me. I have crazy news about Chloe Faraday. She nearly killed me. 
Her phone rang. Gary. Deep breath. Ren, just to let you know, I'm taking Karen to an appointment this morning. I'll be back in the afternoon. No problem, said Ren. Just tell everyone I'm... No need to say another word, said Ren. See you this afternoon. I hope Karen is okay. When she got into Safe Streets, she held a briefing and, with Joe, went through everything they had found out in Texas and the events of the morning with Dainty Faraday. Ren let out the part about Dainty taking her gun. We're issuing a BOLO for Chloe, Dainty Faraday, said Ren. She should be considered armed and dangerous. She is 26 years old, Caucasian, blonde hair, green eyes, 100 pounds, soaking wet. She speaks with a strong Texas accent. We have no recent photo of her. She is a screwed-up, lost and crazy-looking mess. I have no idea how she will react to what happened today. Run to her man or run from him. Love him more or strangle him with her bare hands. There is something feral about Dainty Faraday. She was once the privileged child of a successful father and a born-again Christian mother, whose life went to shit in a spectacular way when her mother got hooked on heroin again. And she's just found out she's been sleeping with her half-brother. She looked unhinged when I told her, but I'm not sure she looked particularly hinged from the get-go. She's been living in an apartment owned by a man called Benny Jakes, who apparently has no idea what's going on. We don't know exactly what Dainty Faraday knew about what Duke Rollins has been doing, if she operated as his accomplice in some way. But when we showed Jonathan Breyer her photo, he confirmed that she was the girl he and Hope Coulson had a threesome with. Everett emailed the photo to Manny's bar, and they've confirmed Dainty as one of the singers who had performed on the night that Carrie Longman was there. She sang that song. Those are her lyrics, and apparently the song title was Croon On Motherfucker and was about her father, so no love lost there. That poor man. We also need to be aware that if she is Rollins' accomplice and she's drawn us her way, he is likely to dump her, i.e. kill her. She, however, probably has no clue that this is what lies ahead for her. Gary arrived in after lunch and called Ren into his office. I'm setting a world record here, he said. Oh, Jesus. Blind fury. He slammed his hands onto the desk. Where do I start? This morning, heading to an apartment building alone. But... And not only that, but ripping Rodeal a new one? Are you out of your mind? So... Let me get this straight, said Wren. You call me in here to shout at me for shouting at someone else because it's unprofessional? I'm not shouting. Yes, you are. Maybe I didn't think I was shouting either. Wren, so help me God, if you turn one more admonishment around to make you the victim, I swear I will fire you right there and then. Gary, Douglas County fucked up. They didn't run Wanda Rollins' DNA through the system. It wouldn't have mattered. You know that. Let it go. The lab wouldn't have processed it in time. But still... He sat back in his chair, flung his pen across the room. Just... Just... Sorry, but that was unprofessional of Rodeal. Gary was struggling to maintain his composure. From the woman who had a knife pulled on her today, said Gary... Jesus Christ. He stood up. Do you know something? Do you know what's happened here? I've taken my eye off the ball, and I have found myself riding the Ren Bryce roller coaster again. It's a fucking nightmare ride. Get out of my office. Ren walked down the hallway, tears stinging her eyes. Everett walked toward her. They stopped. The shouting that time, she said, that was for me. Yikes, said Everett. I couldn't hear what he said, but I think I got the gist. You're up for employee of the month? Ran laughed and cried at the same time. 
Everett squeezed her arm. Hang in there. Do what he wants. And don't go chasing skanks or serial killers or waterfalls on your own, girlfriend. What has gotten into you? Oh, you don't know me long enough, that's all. Ran went into the bullpen. Where's Janine? Doesn't she have a day off? said Everett. No, that was yesterday, said Ren. She was going to hang out with her friend Terry. Has Terry been on any nights out you were on? No, said Everett. Why? She's just a little... like a secret friend. I don't know. It's weird. It's probably just different friends from different worlds, said Everett. But what if it's something sinister? You know, there's a killer out there. She tried to laugh. Yes, and Janine has befriended her, of course, said Deverett. Ren's heart started to pound. Janine is tiny and breakable, and Duke Rollins' is type, without the blonde hair. But Carrie Longman was a brunette. Stop. She went into the conference room, called Janine, and got her voicemail again. Hey, now Gary is trying to kill me, too. Call me. Ran went back in to Gary. Sorry to bother you again, she said. But do you know the whereabouts of one Detective Janine Hooks? No, said Gary. But... Text her, said Gary. I have and I've left her voicemails. How long have you been trying to get a hold of her? A few times. Gary looked up. I'm sorry. I don't have any more information for you. I have a really bad feeling about this. You will sound nuts if you say that out loud. Thanks, said Wren. Bright and breezy. Wren sat at her desk and went through all the case files again. She started picturing the autopsy photos, and then Janine's face on her wall of horrors. Her stomach turned. Stop. Janine's personal effects. She tried Janine again, left a voicemail. Do not panic. Dainty Faraday's knife. Knives. Plural. Stop. Janine's memorial service. Duke Rollins' accomplices. He will have more. Multiple accomplices? Terry? Could she really be someone else? Dainty? The sister Robin, back from London? That's nuts. But what if it's not? Work. Go home. Make dinner. Relax. Jesus. Janine, where are you? Her heart started to pound. Chapter 51 Ran got back to the apartment after work and went to the refrigerator. It was empty of food. Shit. But who did I think would have filled it? I need a housekeeper. Or Ben to come back. Where is Janine? Her heart started to race again. The cupboard. Noodles. Coconut milk. Thai green curry spice mix, vegetable stock cubes, freezer, peas, refrigerator door, lime juice from a bottle. I can work with that. Janine, why haven't you called me back? Wall of horrors. Beer. She opened a bottle of Coors Light, turned on the radio, and started to cook. She threw the dinner together. It's missing about five ingredients. I am so not hungry. Where is Janine? She turned on the television and watched an episode of Friends. Where is my friend? She opened another beer. I've tried her ten times now. No response. There's something very wrong. I'll just call over. What's the worst that can happen? The embarrassment of the last time. Ren jumped into the jeep. She drove down I-70, listening to pounding music at full volume, slowly increasing her speed to 85 miles an hour. 
her back window filled with flashing blue lights. Oh, no, you don't. She hit the accelerator harder. The siren struck up. Fuck, fuck, fuck. Bren pulled in. She rolled down the window. She took out her creds. As the cop walked toward her, she held it out the window. Officer and Special Agent Ren Bryce from Safe Streets. I'm on an urgent... The cop leaned into the window. Ma'am, have you been drinking? What the... No. Ma'am, could you please step out of the vehicle? Officer, this is a life or death situation here. I have to... Ma'am... No fucking way, said Ren. My friend, my colleague, is in very real danger. We're working on the serial killer investigation. I'm not fucking around here. Ma'am, I can smell alcohol on your breath. But I... Oh, shit. Oh, shit. Her heart started to pound. Oh, my God, she said. I apologize, officer. I had one and a half bottles of beer. I... I forgot. How could I forget that? One and a half, said the officer. Yes, I swear to God, said Wren. I was preparing dinner. I I completely forgot. I don't usually do that. I... If you're promising me that's all you had, I'm going to let you go. And I'm going to forget the attitude. I really am sorry, said Wren. Her hand was on the key in the ignition. My friend... The officer slapped the roof of the jeep. Go ahead. Thank you. Thank you so much. I'm a fucking idiot. She put her foot to the floor. She kept trying Janine's cell phone on the drive. It kept being off. Wren sped into the parking lot of Janine's building, punched in the code, ran up the stairs. She rang Janine's doorbell. Please be here. Please be taking a nap or watching a box set or anything at all because nothing else matters as long as you're here. Ran rang the doorbell. Or somewhere safe, anywhere. Don't be dead. Ran rang the doorbell again. Okay, you're asleep. Ran put her spare key in the door, opened it, walked in, listened, called out Janine's name, walked further in, called out Janine's name. She saw her cell phone on the table. She saw her wallet. Oh, God. She's dead. Jesus. She's going for a walk. Ran could feel her legs shaking. She sat down on Janine's beautiful, cozy sofa. This is not good. I know this is not good. But I often think things are not good when they're perfectly fine. I hate this. What am I supposed to think? She stood up. Janine is in danger. I just know she is. I can feel it in my heart. She went into Janine's bedroom. Pristine, as always, smelling of beautiful things. She went into the bathroom, the same. She went into the kitchen. She opened the fridge. Salad, apples, salad, apples. Why don't you look after yourself? Eat, be strong, be able to fight back more. Where are you? Ran went back into the living room and sat down. She called Robbie. Robbie, have you heard from Janine? No said Robbie. Should I have? I wish you had, said Wren. She's not here. I'm at her apartment. Her cell phone's here, her wallet. Are you worried? said Robbie. She could hear him shifting in his chair. You'll sound like a lunatic. Who cares? It's Robbie. Yes, I'm really worried. I have a bad feeling. Why? I just do, said Wren. Silence. She's probably gone for a walk, said Robbie. Maybe she's gone to Woody's for pizza. Just didn't want to be disturbed. They shared a small silence at the unlikelihood Janine would leave her phone behind. Maybe, said Wren. I'll go check. Thanks. I mean, is there anything else going on? Said Robbie. Are you worried about her state of mind? She's looking a little gaunt. Now he notices. No, no, she's fine. Just let me know if she calls. Ren stood up. She looked at Janine's phone. Oh, last dial calls. She turned on the phone. 
the collar list was cleared. Hmm. Ren scrolled through her contacts. I feel dirty. Terry, she might know. Ren dialed the number. It beeped like a discontinued number. No, Terry. Something is wrong. She's not who Janine thinks she is. Chapter 52 Ren left Janine's apartment and locked the door behind her. She drove to Woody's and parked outside. Why am I even doing this? I know she's not here. She sucked in a breath, suddenly overwhelmed by Janine's cell phone in her hand, a rock-solid reminder that she was unable to do anything to locate her. Cell phones were strange objects. Turned off, left behind, diverted. They stripped people of power in a way a regular phone never had. Everyone had their cell phone with them. Didn't they? Where are you? Ren sat at a table in Woody's. What am I supposed to do now? Maybe I'm losing it. She's probably fine. A cheery server came over to Ren. Hey there, what can I get you? She said. I might as well eat. I'm here now. Just an order of jalapeno poppers and a Coke. Thank you. You bet. Ren scrolled again through Janine's phone. I'm not reading the texts. That's wrong. But then, they could explain a sudden absence, the fleeing, the leaving shit behind. There were epic text exchanges between Ren and Janine. They were the bulk of the texts. There were more to different people, but none to Terry. Weird. Unless Janine was protecting her privacy. Unless she was just deleting sensitive exchanges. But then... She hadn't wiped the sensitive exchanges with me, and we're closer. Maybe Terry was having some kind of problems. Privacy. The Privacy of Lunatics Act. Eating disorder. Maybe she met Terry at a support group. That's why it seems so covert. Ren looked at her contact details. Terry's address was there, under her first name only. Ten minutes away. Oh, thank God. I'll do a drive-by. If I see Janine there, I'll keep going. Ren got up to leave and met the server walking towards her with her orders. She slapped $15 on the tray, took the Coke, said thank you, and left. Ren pulled into Terry Street. It was quiet, lined with ranch houses and various states of disrepair. Terry's was one of the better ones. Nothing dazzling, nothing shabby. There was no car outside. Ran went up the path. She rang the doorbell. What the hell do I say if she comes to the door? There was no answer. She looked in the small window. Her stomach sank. This house does not look lived in. Nothing on the walls. Nothing under the stairs. She could see down the hallway that there was nothing on the kitchen counter. Ran ran to the living room window. Oh, shit. Oh, fuck. It was entirely empty. There was absolutely nothing in the room. Terry no longer lives at this address. She may never have. She's Duke Rollins' accomplice. She's Dainty Faraday, or her sister, or someone else entirely. Oh, my God. Janine doesn't know I found Dainty today. Janine has never seen the Faraday twins' photos. Not the recent ones. Ran ran to the neighbor's house. She hammered on the screen door, held up her creds. A woman in her thirties came to the door, tentatively. She studied the badge. She opened up. Yes, she said. I'm Special Agent Ren Bryce from Denver Safe Streets. I want to ask you about the woman next door. Terry. She paused. I don't know her last name. I have no fucking idea. Jesus Christ. The woman looked surprised. No one lives next door. Not for at least two years. Everything in Ren's body felt like it was plunging, melting, 
breaking, shattering. Terry, said Rem. There's definitely not a Terry next door. Are you sure? Yes, said the woman. They've been trying to rent it for a while, though the sign's been down for the past three months, so maybe someone was planning to move in. I don't know. Rem's heart was pounding. The targets are Gary and me. The fallout is Karen Detling for him and Janine for me. Ben is too far away. No, 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 no. Oh, God. Carly Rain, the Golden. Maybe Rollins was really there for Janine. She called Gary. His phone was diverted. What is wrong with everyone? Where are you all? Think, Ren. Where could Janine be? At the store, at a bar, being killed. Support group, at a support group. Tonight is Wednesday. That was the night I called to the house when Terry was there. Ram googled eating disorder support groups in the area and found only one that met on Wednesdays in a community hall in Evergreen, a 25-minute drive from Golden. But wouldn't Janine have brought her phone? And is it ridiculous for me to drive all that way? The meeting was ending as Ren arrived. Have I missed Janine? Did she go with Terry, get a ride back with her? Ren waited until everyone left before going into the room. A woman was tidying up some pamphlets on the table at the back. Ren knew from the webpage that she was Megan Knight, the support group supervisor. Megan Knight? said Ren. Yes, she said. I'm afraid you're a little late for the meeting. Stop eyeing me that way. Ren held up her badge. Actually, I'm here about another matter. Oh, said Megan, her eyes wide. Don't worry, I understand you have to protect people's privacy, but I'm trying to find this woman. She showed Megan the photo of Janine. Yes, I've seen her, said Megan. She's been coming over the last, I want to say, three months. Good for you, Janine. But I'm stung you didn't tell me. She never speaks, said Megan. But we don't like to put people under pressure. They've shown up. That's a positive step we don't want to undo. She's a very private person, said Wren. Megan, I believe she made a friend there. A woman called Terry? Megan nodded. Yes, there's a Terry who comes here. She often talks about her dogs, how much she loves her dogs. Shit, that would totally suck Janine in. Did she ever mention where she lived? Said Wren. She told Janine that she lived in Golden, but I don't think that's true. Really? Said Megan. Why would she lie? Because she's a killer, or a killer's accomplice. I don't know said Wren. Is there anything you can think of that might help? The nature of what we do allows for so much secrecy, said Megan. I'm not sure how useful I can be. Let me rack my brains. Were they here tonight? said Wren. No, said Megan, which was a little strange because Terry was planning to speak again tonight. Oh, shit. Why would she not show? What does she look like? said Wren. Oh, the Faraday girl's photo. Wren showed Megan the photo of Robin Faraday. Is that her? said Wren. Or if you could maybe imagine that face thinner, with different hair? Megan shook her head. No, Terry looks nothing like that. She's a little heavier. She would have auburn hair, smaller eyes... And a wider nose. Definitely not this lady. Thank God. But I know this is temporary relief. Because Duke Rollins has all kinds of accomplices. I feel so sick. Ran drove back toward Golden. She tried Gary's phones three times. Eventually, she left a message. Gary, answer my fucking calls. I'm not fucking around here. Where the fuck are you? This is serious shit. 
Janine has dropped off the face of the earth. I'm worried about her. Call me. I need to fucking talk to people. Where are my people? Ren drove back to the address Terry had given Janine. Maybe she could check the mailbox, take a walk around the back this time. See, was there anything there that would reveal anything? Ren's mobile started to ring. She looked down. Robbie. Did you find her? said Ren. No, said Robbie. I was just calling to see, did you? No, said Ren. I'm really worried. I... You sound it, said Robbie. I'm concerned her new friend is someone Duke Rollins sucked in, said Ren. I think... She started crying. Her name is Terry. Ren, Ren, calm down, said Robbie. I'm sure it's all very innocent. Are you? said Ren, wiping her eyes. Are you? I can't handle this. I can't breathe. What if this is Colin Grabian and he knows? What is this Colin Grabian thing? said Robbie. His tone was gentle. Colin Grabian is right now being an idiot in Vegas. Someone emailed me a screen grab of one of his Facebook posts, okay? Does that help? Jesus. Thanks, Robbie. Yes. Yes, it does. I am losing my mind. Oh, my God, said Ren. There's a car pulling up. I gotta go. Pulling up where? said Robbie. Where are you? I'm outside. I'm... Don't tell him. I'm... I can't breathe. Oh, my God. It's Janine. She's fine. She's alive. Well, good to know. Are you okay now? Yes, said Ren. Yes. She ended the call. She slid down in the seat and watched as Janine and Terry got out of Terry's car and took out bags from Bed Bath and Beyond and carried them up to the front door. Of Terry's new rental, obviously. Stupid fucking neighbor not knowing that, scaring the shit out of me. Ren collapsed into tears. I'm so tired. When Janine and Terry had gone inside, Ren drove away, went back to Janine's apartment, and returned her phone. Jesus Christ. How can the pieces add up so perfectly to create the wrong answer? Chapter 53 Dainty Faraday was lying naked on the messed-up mattress. It was a raw nakedness, rough and careless, with nothing sensual about it. No attempt to be sensual. She had just taken a hit and was limp and dozy. Lights streamed through the high windows above her, making bright squares on her flesh and across the mattress. Duke walked in and lay on the next mattress along, on his back, arms behind his head, legs crossed at the ankles. He didn't like it when she stayed here, but the feds had descended on Benny's apartment. There would be no going back there. Duke knew there was nothing of him in that place. He had never been there. The dainty. Dainty was a powerful link. Dainty, get on over here, said Duke. She smiled her junky smile. He knew that smile. He'd seen it a hundred times before. She was the daughter of an addict. He was the son of an addict. He went one way, drank in moderation. She went the other, down her mama's junky path. That suited him, though. That suited him down to the dirty ground. He was the one who guided her along it. Danny, he called. Danny, lady, I'm waiting for you. He didn't tell her about the pills he took to get him hard. She could be real mocking, like her bitch mama. This is your fault, he called, pointing to his crotch. You need to take care of a man. Look at what you're doing to me. I'm waiting. He took off his jeans. 
He took everything off. Danny turned toward him. Her smile was mocking. He looked down at his erection, back up at her. She blinked a few times. Fuck you, you junkie bitch. She reached out her arm, rolled to the edge of the bed and picked up her guitar. She slid it toward herself, sat up against the wall and began to play, began to sing. You have a beautiful voice. Such a beautiful voice. He closed his eyes. Nothing like your mama's. That's real beautiful, Danny, he said. But I need you to take care of this, he said. Or I'm going to come over and stuff it in your face. I'm going to pry open your jaws and choke you with it. Instead, she started a new song. A four-chord song. It's a new one, she said. Here goes. Found his pills inside his pants. Pops them so he's got a chance. Swore he'd never love another. He ain't Harry. He's my brother. She ended on a flourish. Broke out in a cackling laugh. Harris. Harry. That was funny. You gotta admit, that was funny. Oh, you dumb bitch. You dumb, dumb bitch. Then she broke down and cried, and her guitar fell to the floor with a bang and the dull sound of tuneless strings. Hours later, Dainty drifted out of her terrible sleep. She could feel water pouring down on her. It wasn't water. He was standing over her. What are you doing? She said. Oh, my God! She tried to roll out from under the flow, and it was then her body erupted in pain. She screamed. All the realizations happened at once. She was naked. She was cold. She was wet. Terribly wounded. She was bleeding. No, she moaned. No, 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 no. And there are no drugs to numb you now. She started shivering violently. He was laughing as he zipped up his fly. He raised his foot and kicked her hard. She howled in pain, howled again. Get up, he said. What are you doing? She said. Her words were slurred, but edging into hysteria. Why are you doing this to me? What have I ever done to you? I'm going to be one of your victims now. We're family. Run, rabbit, run, he said. She whimpered. I can't. Um, he grabbed her by the arm and yanked her up off the ground. Her legs buckled underneath her. He tried to steady her. They buckled again. No! She sobbed. No! Just look at me. Look at me. No! She tried to control her sobs. Please don't. Please. I love you. You know I do. I love you, Harris. I love you. Duke stared at her. People like us. We don't know what love is. Chapter 54 Wren called in sick the next day. She had barely slept and spent most of the day laying on the sofa, staring at the wall of horrors. She tried to stop, tried to watch a box set, tried to do anything to take her mind off her mind. I am jumping out of my skin. Her cell phone rang. Janine. Can't face her. It's the phone. No faces. Still. 
She let it go to voicemail, then listened to the message. Hey there, heard you're sick. Hope you're feeling better. If you need anything, let me know. Oh, and you're invited to dinner at Terry's. She's just moved into a new place. She'd love to meet you. Okay, call me. Hope you're cozy. She put down the phone, and it rang immediately. Glenn Buddy. I can't face him. Don't want to talk to anyone. I can't imagine speaking. Having that energy. The world is fucked up. The world is fucking me up. She let the call go to voicemail. I don't even have the energy to listen. Curiosity killed the cat. She checked the message. Ren, I'm calling with some good news. We got the guy. The hit and run of your friend on Mardike Street. Two young kids on a joyride. Not the big bad wolf. So, no one is out to get you. He ended with his big laugh. I'm crazier than the alien Sedalia lady. Ren ignored food and calls for the rest of the day, then wandered into her bedroom, sat on the bed, and picked up a novel she had started four times before. It was great, but it all felt too trivial. Bigger things were happening out there. There were bigger things to think of. She stared at her toenails perfectly manicured in blood red. And she thought about female victims on autopsy tables, their lives cut short in all states of grooming, and how one could be preserved forever. Toenails in need of a pedicure, bikini line needing a wax. There's a shitty motivation not to let yourself go. The intercom buzzer rang. Ren went over, checked the screen. Joe Lucchese. What the what now? Bryn? Hi. Sorry to call over like this. I know you're sick. I just wanted to go through a few things. I hope I'm not crossing a line. Of course you're crossing a fucking line. Not at all, said Ren. Come on up. Draw me to same considerations. She went over and pulled the curtain across the wall of horrors. I need to keep him contained in the micro-kitchen. Joe Lucchese looked ridiculous in the kitchen. Ren had no choice but to bring him into the living room, so they could both breathe and not look like they were in Gulliver's travels. They talked through the case, but something about the conversation felt forced. The lapses into silence, the awkward pauses the strands they struggled to politely disagree on. He has an agenda. I'm going to leave him so he can work himself up to getting to the point. Can I get you more coffee? said Ren. It will be great, thanks. She went into the kitchen, made coffee, and came back in five minutes later. Joe was standing, but the curtain pulled all the way back, looking at the wall. He turned around. Whoa, barely restrained fury. You heard about the Wall of Horrors. That's why you're here. Violation. Why haven't you told me some of this shit? Said Joe. His eyes were ablaze. This is my home, said Ren. That was private. Fuck you, asshole. This is my life, said Joe. This is a picture of my... Wife, for God's sake. I know, said Ren. You have to understand, this is not for anyone else but me. That's why it's at home. I'm respecting your privacy and my own. I'm putting stuff together. I'm not sure how some of these elements are connected, or even if they are. There's stuff up here that isn't at safe streets, said Joe. Yes, my crazier ideas. Why is Grace's name up here? Said Joe. Because I'm worried. I think she's part of this. She's a target. I don't know. I can't alarm you. And Sean's, 
said Joe. Their names are there because your family has been targeted before, said Wren. And obviously, Gary's wife has been. Karen is up there, too. This is not just about you. I'm up there myself, minus a photo. It's about so many people. Victims. Why is there a question mark beside Grace's name? A question mark, exactly, because I don't have enough information. I don't know. I don't want to come to you with something I don't know. Is there something you want to tell me? Said Joe. Something I don't know. Is Grace safe? Tell me again, said Wren. Grace is seven or eight on her next birthday. Seven. Wren nodded. That's good to hear. I've been wondering if her age was significant in terms of Rollins wanting to hurt her. Maybe at the same age of that girl that Donald Riggs kidnapped the day you shot her. But she was eight years old. Joe sat down. Exhausted and wired, just like me. They sat in silence for a while. Is there anything else? Said Joe. He was studying the wall. Who's Devin? She's my dog walker, a student from across the street from where I used to live. She's been taking care of my dog, Misty. Devon was a victim of a hit and run. She was dressed in my jacket. I was worried it was a case of mistaken identity, but I just got a call from DPD. They got the two kids involved. It was a regular hit and run. And yes, there are regular occurrence around here. Anything else about all this you want to talk to me about? Any ideas you want to bounce off me? Said Joe, calming somewhat. To be honest, I'm tired looking at it, said Wren. It's all I think about. Joe stood up. He looked at his watch. In that case, come on. Let me buy you a drink. It's the least I could do for intruding. There's a great bar around the corner from my hotel. Smallest bar I've ever been in. As long as the measures are big. The bar was minuscule, styled like a gentleman's club. August, austere. Its atmosphere ruffled by Joe Lucchese and Ren Bryce drinking and laughing for four hours straight. They ordered a final drink. Okay said Joe. It's time for me to fess up. I am now nervous and having a slight spike of sobriety. And it's gone. I probably should have said this sooner, said Joe. But I didn't want to make you uncomfortable. Is there a reason why you want to make me uncomfortable now? He laughed. Well, I think you'll handle it. I don't think there are a lot of things you can't handle. L-O-L. His face went a little serious. Just... There's something about you that reminds me of my wife. Did not see that coming. And I've been looking at her photo for days. Oh, said Wren. And now it all makes sense. Wow. I don't know what to say to that. Dead wife stuff is a minefield. I'm sorry if that made me treat you any differently, said Joe. It kind of freaked me out, and I think Sean had the same reaction when he saw you. He came off as a bit rude. Uh, I'm sure you saw that. He's not. Anna was slim like you, uh, a little shorter maybe, but similar coloring... She had that edge, he laughed. But it was more French, fiery in a moody way. You, there's something dangerous about you. Like, it's what you're looking out for. Anna wasn't. But she got it. The world at its worst. Because of me. You can't keep blaming yourself said Wren. Joe shrugged. But you don't know any other way to live. 
Have you been to therapy? said Wren. I ask with zero expectation of a positive response. Joe laughed. Correct. No, I have not. Don't underestimate it, said Wren. Look how amazing I've turned out. That's not going to happen, said Joe. Not now. I'm good. I've got the kids. Grace saved my life. I know, you told me. We all have stories. This is your story. But I'm guessing you don't get a chance to tell it all that often. And you probably need to. I literally don't know what I would have done without her, said Joe. But I would bet that I wouldn't have made it. I will never forget when she was born, and she was whisked off to one side. And Anna was in such distress, and Grace wasn't breathing, and I was there, and it was fucking terrifying. It was like... I can't describe it. Next thing, I hear Grace crying, and the relief. I can't express it. But then Anna... Anna was gone. Just like that. The alarms were going off, left and right. I was pushed out of the room, and they were working on Anna. It was like... Like her last breaths went to Grace. That's what the timing was like. It fucked with my head for a long time. I couldn't get it out of my mind. But when they handed me Grace, I... I was blown away. She was this perfect, beautiful little thing. And that was that. She got my heart. Right there. I was gone. She was mine. I was hers. My mascara. More details this time. They descended into silence. I don't think I've ever told a woman that story before, said Joe. Ran wiped away tears. Jesus, maybe don't. I mean, if I was on a date with you, I'd be so out of there. I know. Heavy stuff, said Joe. You're easy to talk to, I guess. He took a breath. The graduation isn't the only reason I brought Grace. We have a doctor's appointment for test results. Well, he's a pediatric gastroenterologist, the best in the country. Grace hadn't been gaining weight for the past few months. We're not sure why. I, I can't bear to imagine. Jesus Christ. Don't imagine, said Wren. I know that's probably impossible, but wait and see. Worrying won't help anyone. Grace looks like a very healthy little girl. This could be a temporary thing. A food allergy. I don't know. Joe nodded. That's what I keep telling myself. She put her hand on his arm. Possibly inappropriate. Sorry I was an asshole to you, said Joe. You were fine. He laughed. You thought I was an asshole. Maybe, but I don't anymore. Which is a total disaster. Because now I'm back to finding you as attractive as when I first saw you at the airport. Go home, Ren. Go home. This would be a good time to go home. Chapter 55 Duke Rollin sat at the bar of the Maker Hotel in the final flat and yellowing stages of a pint of Guinness. He rubbed his jaw, the side without the scar, which he had covered with hair sprayed from a can of tiny fake hairs. They wouldn't last long, but from a reasonable distance, you can never tell. He still had the shaved head. That was a good look. That wasn't in the picture that was released to the public. 
He'd walked by his face on newsstands everywhere. It was an old face. No one had done a double take yet. Duke watched as Joe Lucchese walked into the lobby, loose-limbed, unsteady on his feet, searching his pockets for his key card. There was a woman behind him, dressed in black, slim, laughing. She turned toward the darkness of the bar. Duke felt his heart pound wildly. It was like the first time he saw her run down the steps to her jeep outside Safe Streets. How it was like seeing a ghost. Or close enough. She was a little taller than Anna Lucchese, but if he got her on all fours, that wouldn't matter. And if it was from behind, with her dark hair yanked back, balled into his fist, she could easily pass for Anna Lucchese. Anna Lucchese had had a powerful effect on him. Ren Bryce, bipolar support drinking buddy. Right now, this special agent was leaning in to Joe Lucchese. He was leaning into her. Two birds, one stone. Joe was guiding her to the elevators, his hand on her lower back. Something was going on with these two. They were close. And this one was wild. He'd seen her drink. He'd seen her run into that burning barn. He'd seen her discharge her weapon over and over. She was something different. He laughed. There were so many ways to hurt Joe Lucchese. This time, he would make him watch. Chapter 56 Joe opened the door of the hotel room, slid the keycard into the wall slot. Ren followed him in. Drink, said Joe. Yes, please. Go home now. Joe crouched down and opened the mini bar. What do you like? Champagne. It's love more than like. But champagne's not very appropriate, is it? Jesus, relax. It's a drink. What's the worst that can happen? Ben finds a cork in my bag. That's not the worst. You know that. Stop. Leave now. This is dangerous. Don't be ridiculous. You'd never cheat on Ben. Again. That doesn't count. What does count? You'd kill Ben if he did this. I would. Go. No! It's just a drink! Joe had already popped the cork. Champagne it is, he said. He poured them both a glass. They raised them, clinked them. It's a beautiful room, said Wren. Well, let's just say I have a very wealthy father who insisted, because of the shit show that is my life, on giving me a huge chunk of my inheritance so I wouldn't have to be hanging around waiting for him to die. That's his sense of humor. I fought against his money for years, and then I just gave in. More for Grace than me. And make sure she appreciates every bit of it, that's for sure. And just so we're clear, I'm appreciating this room a lot. And I think I used your father's approach on Danny Faraday. She sat against the dressing table, then slid up on top of it. Joe was sitting on the table opposite her, a little to the right. The bed was a vast, ignored space ahead of her. They finished the bottle swapping war stories, laughing. Joe went to the minibar and pulled out two vodkas and tonics. Don't come near me. He walked over to her, stood in front of her, but instead of handing her the drink, he didn't move. His thighs were touching against her legs. He looked into her eyes. She could barely focus on them. You are a sexy man's man. I am weakened by a sexy man's man. Man's man? Man. All men. Joe put the drinks onto the dressing table. With his right hand, he reached out, sliding it behind her neck, lifting up her hair, 
leaning down to kiss her neck all the way up to her mouth. Neck first. Nice move. Very nice. I want you. But I may not mean it. Joe pulled her toward him. Okay. Wait, said Ren. This isn't right. We shouldn't be doing this. Come on, said Joe. Why not? Where do I start? I have a boyfriend. I... Joe looked at her. Ren laughed. You need a better reason, obviously. How about I remind you of your dead wife? Joe retreated, sat on the bed. Well, I guess telling you that you reminded me of Anna wasn't a smooth move. I'm guessing at that point neither of us thought we'd wind up back here. She sat down beside him. True, said Joe. So let's just keep drinking, said Wren. She raised her glass and stood back up again. Fuck, my head is spinning. Five hours later, Wren woke up on her back, her jaw tight, her fists clenched. The room was in darkness. A crack of sunlight shone through the curtains, slicing down across the floor. Where the effing crap? She raised her head. Oh, dear God. Never do that again. Never be part of such a miserable cliché. I'm topless. Who the fuck is beside me now? It was Ben the last time. Let it be Ben. I'm only naked on top, which tells me nothing. What did I do? Topless equals already a cheater. It's surfacing. The night is surfacing. No! You loser! How can you do this? Again! Jesus Christ, you need help! Beside her, Joe Lucchese slept soundly. What the fuck happened to his mouth? His hands on my... His mouth... Did I bite him? Jesus! Oh, oh, no! She reached her fingers to her head. Ouch! Shit! I need water. I need to check my wound. How come I have a wound? Run. Run for the bathroom. Warning, you will meet your own shabby face. And blood. She checked her face in the mirror. You are frightening. The cut was small, but quite deep, crescent-shaped, above her right eyebrow. Errant tweezers it is. She went to the toilet like she was playing the silence game. She washed her hands, dipped a face cloth in water, and dabbed at the mascara under her eyes, then rubbed, then just abandoned the whole ridiculous enterprise. She was about to walk out of the bathroom, when she heard the buzz of Joe's phone on the nightstand. He's awake. Great. Go out. Have a conversation. You, him. Nothing to stand between you but your tits. She walked out. Hey. Morning, said Joe. He smiled wide. Ow. He touched his fingers to his mouth. Ren smiled back. Does any man give a shit if a woman has a boyfriend? Do they all just go for it at all times? I remember. We didn't have sex. We didn't even kiss. I am not a cheater. Woohoo! Can I ask, said Ren, what the fuck happened to your lip and my head? Joe laughed, then held his mouth again. Ow. It was my fault. We were fooling about. I threw you down on the bed. I was getting down there beside you, but you're so light. You bounced back up and your forehead caught me in the mouth. They both burst out laughing. How old are we exactly? said Ren. Oh, God. 
Moore is coming back. I told him I love my boyfriend. To be filed under things you say to widowed colleagues while you are near naked. Widowed? Sorry about last night, said Wren, bending down to pick her bra up off the floor, putting it on as Joe kindly looked the other way. Staying in your room and everything. I should have gone home. I'm the one who should apologize, he said. No reason to. Let's end this conversation. Ren went around the room, picking up her clothes, getting dressed. For once, can I just discard my clothing in one tidy, less demeaning pile? Or maybe I could stay clothed. Chapter 57 Ren got a text from Ben as she sat down at her desk. Morning, baby. Miss that hot body. Kiss, kiss. Hot? No. Ice cold. And in another man's bed. Jesus Christ. If the tables were turned. Get in a fight last night, said Everett. No, said Ren, looking up, alarmed. Everett laughed. Not you. You, he said, gesturing to Joe. No, said Joe. End of snapped explanation. Ren, you must have stayed out late, said Everett. I see pineapple juice. Aren't you the observant one, said Joe. Leave my Everett alone. Are you in a bad humor because of me, Joe Lucchese? Ren's phone rang. It's Gary. Come into my office. This has to be some kind of joke. Now? said Ren. Gary put the phone down. She went into his office and sat down. Ren, I don't believe you are taking your meds. Oh, shit. But why do you think that? Well, I am. He stared her down. You're showing signs of... With the greatest respect, you have had a lot going on, said Ren at the same time. That did not go down well. All I can say to that is remember what I take are mood stabilizers, said Ren. They stabilize my mood. They don't strip me out of all vitality. I'm not saying you're showing signs of vitality, said Gary. I'm saying you're showing signs of mania. I am not manic, he studied her face. I'm sorry, Ren. I don't believe you. I want to hurt you. It's an extreme and terrifying urge, but I mean it. If you want to strap me down and medicate me, you go ahead, but you'll be saying goodbye to a serial killer if you do. You need me like this. You need me focused. I need you focused, said Gary. And I don't think you are. You are case agent on a huge case. A position of trust that I put you in when... When what? Don't fuck up. I won't. Please, Gary, stop asking me about meds. Let me do my job. Have I fucked up on this yet? No. And I promise, if I come riding through the office, naked on a white horse, waving a bottle of vodka in the air, feel free to shoot me with a trank gun. Just mind the horse. Gary stared at her. Unreadable. By one o'clock, Ren was sitting in Dr. Lone's office. I'm sorry for being sprung on you like this, she said. I, Gary, just called me in again. Told me, boom, you're going to see Dr. Lone at 1 p.m. Just like that. No warning. He must be concerned for you said Lone. Do you have any idea why? No meds talk. You don't have the energy to lie convincingly. No, said Wren, in that there is no problem, but Gary, I would venture, thinks I'm a little paranoid. Lone nodded. Why do you think that? Everyone is asking me why everything. Because I guess I've jumped... 
come to a conclusion or two that was incorrect and, I guess, worst case scenario. That can happen, said Lone. I know, said Wren. That's what I think. Can you go through the incidents he's talking about? Wren talked him through Devin and Janine. Does Grace Lucchese count? So, said Lone, there were several times when you thought you were being targeted, and those closest to you, personally or professionally or both, were being targeted too. Yes, said Wren. The evidence pointed to that. Sometimes things can come together to create a picture that, combined with our personal perspective, our filter... Yeah, 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 I get it. But there was compelling evidence, wasn't there? I understand, said Dr. Lone. But we should also look at the possibility that your angle on that evidence created an extra dimension. Grrr. What do I meant to do? My job is to protect people who are in danger. Do I have to run everything by people before I act on anything? That's not practical in life-or-death situations. But some of these situations were not life-or-death, said Lone. And yes, it would be wise to run these things by at least one other colleague. You have to operate as a team. You are part of a team. Teamwork. Lone smiled. That may not appeal to you at times, but there's a reason why that infrastructure is there. I like to be able to make quick decisions, said Wren. I mean, what if someone was trying to kill Janine, and I hung around waiting to run my theories by someone? She could be dead. Let's talk about loss for a moment, said Lone. Loss? What? Would I be right in saying that you care very much for Janine? Yes, of course. And Ben? Yes. And Gary? Yes. Perhaps you were worried about losing all three of them, said Lone. What? No, I'm not. Not at all. I'm never going to lose them. It might not be at the forefront of your mind, said Dr. Lone, but you might want to consider it. No, thanks. Why would I want to sit around considering my worst possible nightmare? There's something else, too, said Wren. She told him about the previous night. So, what I was wondering was, do you think I should tell Ben? She said. Only you can decide that, said Lone. Really? Really? Aren't you going to tell me that the truth is the only way forward? No, said Lone. But I need you to tell me, said Wren. I am a child. Lone smiled kindly. I know, he said. But you also know that the decision has to come from your heart. I can't tell him, said Wren. My heart won't allow me to. She paused. I don't even know if that's selfish. I don't know what the right thing to do is. He loves me, and I don't deserve him, and... You have to stop thinking that way, said Lone. You didn't take it any further last night, which you've told me is the first time that's ever happened under those circumstances. Yes, said Wren. It's a miracle. As for telling Ben, you don't need to make a decision on that right now. If it's causing you distress... Don't do something just as a quick fix to alleviate that. Ren nodded. Okay. Call me if you need me, said Lone. He handed her a card. This is my cell phone number. Don't tell me. Is it 5150? Lone laughed. 5150 was the code in California for an involuntary psychiatric hold. Urban slang for completely nuts. Do I seem that bad? said Wren. Dr. Lone smiled. It's a cell phone number, 
Not a straitjacket. Ren looked at him. If you know that even good people can hurt people, then how can you ever trust? Lone opened his palms, did an illustrative flourish with his elegant fingers. All you can do is accept that hurt is part of life. Ren took a deep breath. I don't want to hurt anyone. I don't want to be hurt. I don't think I can ever accept hurt as a part of life. Hurt is a part of life, said Lone. It is not, however, the whole of life or the end of life. I like that. Still terrified. Chapter 58 Ren sat in the jeep outside Dr. Lone's office. Her hands were gripping the steering wheel, her forehead leaning against them. I can't go back to work. I feel weird. I have to go back to work. She sucked in a huge breath that felt like it wasn't enough, that she needed more. I have to go to work. I might have a meltdown. No, I won't. I will. She started the engine, and instead of taking the turn that would take her to safe streets, she took the turn to take her home. She sat at the edge of the stiff sofa in the cramped apartment. I hate this place. I need to be at work. I feel weird. I'm jumping out of my skin. I'm always jumping out of my skin. She studied the wall for two hours getting up and down every 15 minutes. This is aggravating. Too many pictures. Too many documents and words and faces. She went into the kitchen and got a cardboard box. She came back into the living room and started to take everything down. She organized them into neat piles on the coffee table, on the sofa, on the floor. The top page on one of the piles had two words. Grace Lucchese. You are a beautiful little girl, and, I hope, a 100% healthy girl. And you're a heroine to have rescued your damaged father. He's a good man. And, hey, aren't we all damaged? The doorbell rang several times. Rand went over to the intercom. She saw Janine's worried face on the screen. She picked up. Janine! Are you okay? said Janine. I tried your phone a hundred times. Roll reversal? Come up, said Wren. Wren stood, almost suspended in the apartment doorway. Janine pushed gently past. Where did you go this afternoon? I covered for you with Gary, but he was not happy. She hovered in front of Wren. Are you okay? said Janine. No, I feel a little insane. Ren shook her head. She started to cry. Janine moved to her, hugging her, guiding her into the living room. She took the stacks of paper and put them down carefully on the floor. They didn't speak. Janine just let her cry. What time is it? said Ren. Five thirty. Shit! Can I get you anything? Tea, coffee, beer, wine? Ren laughed. Wine, wine, wine. She let out a breath. Thank you for coming over. Of course I was going to come over, said Janine. What's up? Oh, I spent the night with Joe Lucchese. What? Ren nodded. I know. We went out. We got hammered. I went back to his room. We didn't have sex, but, you know, I woke up in his bed. Oh. She paused. Are you sure nothing happened? Oh, my God, totally. He told me, and I remembered... Eventually. 
He was really nice. He's a really nice guy. Janine's eyes widened. He screwed up, though, said Ren. Duke Rollins screwed him up bad. I'm not surprised. At either, said Ren. Well, I know you've tried to save me from this kind of shit before, said Ren. That's not the point, though. I just don't want you to end up like this. Tears welled in Ren's eyes. I know. I love you for that. Are you going to tell Ben? Ren shook her head. I don't think so. Should I? It was a mistake. I don't want to throw away everything we have because of drunken bullshit. The tears started to fall. We need tea immediately. Janine stood up. I want to be like you, Janine Hooks. You're sane. You're reliable. You're wonderful. You do not screw up. I am a perpetual disappointment. Janine paused. You took down your wall of horrors, I now realize. It was freaking me out. Ren curled into the sofa, watching the peaceful wall. This has helped. Janine came back in with a tray of tea and biscuits. And the whole world was set to rights, said Janine. I just love you. I feel so guilty. I can't even tell you the crazy thoughts I had about your poor friend Terry and what Duke Rollins might have done to you. There's crazy, and there's crazy. The scary, genuine, can't-even-make-a-joke-about-it kind. Oh, Jesus, said Ren. I just remembered what I did last night. When Joe went to the bathroom, I got Camille's number from his phone. The nanny. Ren checked her contacts. Look! Why? said Janine. I was so worried said Ren, worried that his family is not safe. It was for reassurance. I have it in case I need it, but I couldn't ask Joe for it because he'd think I was nuts. Janine's look told her she agreed. Now, said Janine, to take us away from all things drunken and personal, why don't we talk about the case? That, said Ren, would be perfect. Her phone rang. Joe Lucchese. It's him, said Ren. Answer it, said Janine. I feel about fourteen. Ren picked up. Hey, said Joe. Hello there. I'm calling with some very good news, said Joe. Grace and I were at the doctor this afternoon, and she's all good. Test results were clear. She is fighting fit. Oh, thank God, said Ren. Thank God. That's wonderful to hear. It is. It is, said Joe. And I wanted to say thank you for last night. I had fun. It was what I needed. The hangover this morning, not so much. Oh, I know that feeling, said Ren. And thank you, too. It was hilarious. I won't see you tomorrow at the office. It's Sean's graduation. What are you doing after? Which sounds like a come on. Janine was rolling her eyes in agreement. Sean's got a wild night planned, said Joe. I'm going to go ahead up to Breck. We've got two nights there. He'll follow me up the next day if his head is still working. Be careful out there, said Ren. I'm always careful. You're so serious. Bomb explodes in auditorium. Jesus. Worst case scenario again. I think we're all safe at a graduation, said Joe. We're lucky Duke Rollins doesn't like the grand public gestures. Yet. Monster mutating. Stop. Have fun, said Ren. Tell Sean I say congratulations. I will.
See you in a couple of days. Looking forward to it, said Ren. Janine looked at her when she hung up. Looking forward to what? Nothing, said Ren. It's just an expression. Seeing him in work, that's all. Back to the case, said Janine. I can't get the Kurt Vine thing out of my head, said Ren. The real connection. And it's still freaking me out that Joe hasn't made Grace safe. How do you know that, said Janine. Well, he didn't say he was going to Breck alone. Probably because it would have sounded like he was inviting you. True, Ren sighed. It's all rather exhausting. Let's check out Vine's website, said Ren. If that was his first point of contact with Duke Rollins, if that's how Rollins found him, I'd like to know what it was that drew him in. They opened up ForTheForgotten.net. They scrolled through the images. He wasn't a bad photographer, said Janine. Oh, said Ren, pointing to the screen. These ones were in the Denver Post after that retrospective series on asylums. And then, the rapes happened. It's Kennington. That was the building Everett was talking about. Ren could feel Janine tense beside her. They both knew that the Kennington rapist, now in prison, had attempted to rape Ren. Janine simply squeezed Ren's forearm and stuck with the task at hand. God bless you. And look at all the eerie woodland shots, said Janine. This kind of shit fascinates me too, though, said Ren. But I'm still going to decide he's a psycho and I'm not. Look at this place, the Osler Building. It's an old toy factory, said Janine, pointing. Creepsville, as you would say. Don't touch my screen, said Ren. Sorry, said Janine. Where is this place? said Ren. Oh, it's in Rhino by the railroad, near my filthy man gym. Yikes! I think you can see that from safe streets. I always thought that part was just a chimney. These external shots are old, though, said Janine. They're vintage, 60s looking. Yes. Because I think we may have noticed if there was a giant cutout doll's head towering over Rhino. Vine must have found the building, bought the vintage shots of it online somewhere, or found the photos, then tracked down the building. I mean, you can't get more abandoned than that. And yes, said Janine, look at the inside. There's the head propped up against the wall. Jesus. A flat, timbered doll's head, said Ren, beside a plastic bucket filled with regular doll's heads. Terror overload. Why are doll's heads so sinister, said Janine. Because they rotate 360, their dead eyes blink twice, and at night, they push nightmares via your tear ducts into the back of your eyeballs. Did someone actually tell you that? My brother, Jay, said Ren. No wonder I'm screwed up. And he said they block up your tear ducts so you can't cry, so no one can hear you cry. She looked at Janine. I think you need to stay over tonight. Chapter 59 Ren spent the next morning at Safe Streets, studying everything that was pinned to the notice boards. She was briefed by the investigators present on their progress. She went for a late lunch with a paperback so she could breathe, have space, detach. Instead, she was drawn to thoughts of Duke Rollins. She switched to thinking about Ben, and that led her to Joe. Grrr, get out of my head. Sean's graduation. She texted Joe. Good luck to Sean. Forensic psychology. We may employ him in the future. To the great horror of his NYPD dad. Joe replied, 
Promise me, son, not to do the things she's done. Coward of the County, Kenny Rogers. Wren replied, LMFAO. She could see Sean Lacazy as an FBI profiler. A sullen one. Serious, dedicated. Oh, Jesus. She looked through her contacts for Vincent Faraday and dialed his number. It rang over and over until he picked up as she was about to abandon hope. Mr. Faraday, it's Special Agent Ren Bryce, she said. I met with you and... Yes, yes, he said. Could I ask you a question? Go ahead. You mentioned a young man from New York calling to your home to ask you questions about Duke Rollins. You said he seemed like he was interested in the truth, so you spoke with him. Was he one of the forensics people you mentioned who called on you? The silence stretched. Please, please, please remember this. Yes, said Vincent. Yes, he was. Forensic psychology, said Wren. That was it, said Vincent. When was that, said Wren. That would have been, oh, last year, definitely. Did he give you his name, said Wren. Oh, uh, Banner, said Vincent. Banner, said Wren. Sean Banner, said Vincent. Banner, my ass. And no wonder Joe Lucchese looked familiar to you, Mr. Faraday. Wren called Denver University's admissions office. They had no Sean Lucchese, but they did have a master's student called Sean Banner, with an address on the Auraria campus. Wren got there in ten minutes and ran to his room. There were groups of frightened-looking students gathered down the hallway, and a voice raised to an alarming level inside Sean's room. That is Joe Lucchese. What have you done? He was roaring. What the hell have you done? Wren held up her creds to the students. Please move along, everyone. This is under control. Nothing to see here, said one of the kids, and everyone laughed. She waited for them to start moving. There was a sound of a crash and broken glass from inside the room. Jesus Christ. Wren hammered on the door with her fist. It's Wren. Open up. There was silence. Joe, said Wren. Open up now. Silence. Don't make me kick the door in, said Wren. The door unlocked. The first person she saw was Sean Lucchese sitting in the chair by his desk, but facing the door. He was ghostly, his eyes rimmed in red. There was a smashed lamp at his feet. There were books around the floor, on the bed. Joe was standing there, red-faced, sweating, wild-eyed. A force. Wren closed the door behind her. She moved the books along the bed up toward the desk, cleared a space. Joe, sit down said Wren. I'm good, he said. You need to sit down, said Wren. Whatever was in her tone, he did as she said. She leaned against the wall opposite him. What's going on here, she said. Neither man spoke. I'm going to get the ball rolling then, said Wren. I spoke with Vincent Faraday this morning. Joe stood up. We need to talk in private for a moment. Wren glanced over at Sean. I'm fine, he said. You can go into the hallway. I'm not going to do anything. Are you sure you're okay? said Wren. He nodded. She stepped into the hallway with Joe, but left the door open. He was registered here as Sean Banner, said Joe. For obvious reasons. But before you talk to him, you need to know that he doesn't know we're looking at Duke Rollins for this case. I made up some other bullshit as to why I was working with you. 
and you guys didn't release enough details to the media for him to come to that conclusion. Either way, he's been all about getting an internship and his graduation over the past few months. I'll let him tell you what he's been doing. You obviously know some of it already. But yes, as you can see, I just fucking lost it with him, Ren. I lost my fucking mind. I hope you can understand why. I didn't lay a finger on him, but... I know that, said Ren. Of course. Jesus. Take a moment, okay? Joe nodded. He rubbed his hand through his hair, took some deep breaths. I heard he was asking questions around Stinger's Creek, said Ren. It'll blow your fucking mind what he's been doing, said Joe. They went back inside, and Joe took his seat on the bed. Ren stood where she had been. I'm sorry, Dad, said Sean, looking hopefully in his direction. Well, your father is clearly not ready to accept that apology. Tell her said Joe. Tell her what you did. Sean looked reduced, stripped of his twenty-six years back to sixteen, back to infuriating his father. My dissertation for my master's was on serial killers, and I included in that Duke Rollins and Donald Ricks. Holy shit. He only told me this now, said Joe. I'm not surprised your father lost it, said Ren. I cannot believe that he kept that from me all this time, said Joe. I guess your professors couldn't have stopped you doing this, if they didn't know your real name, said Ren. Sean nodded. He turned to Joe. I thought you'd be proud. Joe erupted. Proud? Are you out of your mind? Proud that you threw yourself in the path of the man who has already done his best to destroy us and who will finish the job given half the chance? Didn't you say you believe that Duke Rollins wasn't after you? Oh, you lied, Joe Lucchese. You want him to be after you. It's your only way of getting your chance to kill him. I cannot believe, said Joe, standing again stabbing a finger at Sean. The risk you took. After everything I've done to protect you. The name, the move from New York, your little sister for crying out loud. Didn't you consider Grace? Wouldn't you want to protect her from even a fraction of what you've been through? You selfish, selfish brat. I thought you'd grown up, Sean. I thought you'd fucking grown up. But you're still a self-indulgent little shit. Oh, Jesus. Rain it in, Joe. Sean stood up to face him. I do want to protect Grace, he said. I love her more than anything in the world. How fucking dare you? That's the whole point. I wanted to find a way of getting Duke Rollins that was peaceful, sensible, non-violent. By analyzing his psychology, predicting possible future behavior, thoughtfully studying him, not by firing a fucking gun in his direction, which is your approach to everything. My approach to everything, said Joe. Jesus Christ, that's what you think? Well, look where it got us the last time, said Sean. Your solution to Donnie Riggs, shoot the fucker. And here we are. This is what that gets you. Oh, no. Worst possible thing to say to Joe Lucchese. I can't even bear to see that pain in his face. Sean looked horrified himself. Please, guys, said Ren. Everyone is angry. Of course I'm angry, said Joe. He has jeopardized his entire family. And all I've ever done is try to protect you. He looked deflated. Sit down, both of you, said Ren. This has gotten too... This is too much. They sat down, fuming, staring at the floor. You look so alike. Sean, do you want to talk to me about what you found out about Duke Rollins? Said Ren. I believe that Duke Rollins was systematically 
physically and sexually abused from when he was a very young child, and that his mother, Wanda Rollins, pimped him out to pedophiles in return for drugs. Oh, God. Chapter 60 How did you work that out about Rollins' childhood? said Ren. I thought of us, said Sean, gesturing toward Joe. Joe and Ren looked at him. Yourself? said Joe. He nodded. I thought about how people leave places that bring them bad memories. We left New York to go to Ireland. We left Ireland to come back to the U.S. I left New York again to come here. He shrugged. People leave the places that hold memories they would rather forget. He's right. Where is he going with this? I looked at all the people who moved away from Stingers Creek, said Sean. People who were there around the time that Rollins and Riggs committed these crimes. People who were in school with them. People connected in any way to the crimes. I spoke with everyone I could get hold of. I researched the ones I couldn't. I found a woman called Dorothy Parnum. Her husband, Ogden, was the police chief at the time of the Crosscut Killer investigation. When he killed himself, she relocated to Wichita Falls. Jesus Christ, said Joe. The summer camp at Wichita Falls. You didn't work there at all. No, I did, said Sean. Just not as much as you thought. Joe looked at Wren. Can you believe this shit? Keep going, said Wren. I tracked Dorothy Parnum down to a meeting for child sex abuse victims, said Sean. I joined the group. She spoke. She said she had discovered that her husband had been abusing children. She found photos after he died. Joe nodded. I spoke with a DA, Marcy Winbaum, back in the day, he said. She told me that Duke Rollins visited Ogden Parnum at the police department when the investigation was at its height. Parnum gave Rollins and Riggs an alibi for the night of one of the murders. Marcy Winbaum guessed he was blackmailed into it. She just didn't know why. I spoke with her, too, said Sean. She said the same thing to me. When I put it together with what I knew about Dorothy Parnum, it made sense. I also cross-referenced a whole lot of things that I don't think law enforcement did. I researched every single kid who went to school with Duke Rollins or Donnie Riggs. I interviewed some of them. I interviewed their teachers. I looked at all the information I gathered from a psychological angle with a view to building up a profile of Duke Rollins and a full picture of his childhood. I found a girl who had moved away from Stinger's Creek, a girl called Ashley Ames. In school, she gave Duke Rollins a nickname that apparently tormented him. Pukey Dukey. She told me that Duke Rollins and Donald Riggs raped her when she was 16. She believed this happened because she was the one to have given him this nickname. I thought that seemed extreme, even for Duke Rollins. Then I discovered that Ashley Ames' father was arrested five years ago on a child pornography charge. I think he also abused Duke Rollins, and that was why Ashley Ames was raped. Revenge. I was able to connect her father, Wesley Ames, to Ogden Parnum. They went hunting together, and there were more men who went hunting with them. I'm waiting to hear back from a source who promised to give me more names. I haven't put these details in my dissertation because I would need the legalities to be perfect, but they're part of my research. Rand nodded. I worked up a profile on Rollins said Sean. He went over to the pile of papers and books on the bed. He pulled out a slim file, passing it right in front of Joe's face to hand it to Wren. Ouch. Wren started to read the profile. This is great, Sean, 
You've picked up on a lot of points from the FBI's profile. Nothing new, nothing new, nothing new. Oh. There were two things at the end. Duke Rollins has a deep hatred and mistrust of law enforcement or anyone in a position of trust. This is likely due to the abuse he may have suffered at their hands as a child. It culminated in his particular hatred of NYPD Detective Joe Lucchese, whose family he targeted in a sustained campaign following the shooting dead of Rollins' accomplice, Donald Riggs. What is it? said Joe. Let me keep reading, said Wren. She read on about the rapes and murders, but it was the final comment that sent a shiver up her spine. Combining the background, experience, modus operandi, behavior, interests, and obsessions that come together to make up Duke Rollins, I believe that his deep mistrust of law enforcement will lead him to pursue any law enforcement officer who has engaged with him in the past on any level. Duke Rollins is a psychopath, and as such, suffers from all forms of cognitive distortion. His thought patterns are entirely weighted toward the negative in all aspects of his life. He is consumed by what he sees as his righteous entitlement to vengeance, following the death of his closest ally, his accomplice, Donald Riggs. For Rollins to achieve his goals, having perceived any original failures in that regard as catastrophic, he will stalk, study, and watch his targets closely before he attacks. He will leave nothing to chance. Ren could feel a rush of realization. The glass in Donna Doris's feet. Clear, blue, green. The color of doll's eyes. Duke Rollins, law enforcement, watch them, like a hawk. This was what Duke Rollins wanted from Kurt Vine. Access to the tower of the toy factory in Rhino, whose windows overlook safe streets. Rand closed the file and handed it back to Sean. Jesus Christ. Duke Rollins has been watching us all this time. Chapter 61 Ran moved toward the door, looking from Sean to Joe. Okay, she said, her face impassive. She checked her watch. The graduation is in what, 40 minutes? I'm going to leave you gentlemen to it. You can make up, hopefully, and go in peace. She smiled. And Joe, I'll see you when you get back from Breckenridge. Congratulations, Sean. She handed him her card. If your source comes through on the names of Rollins' abusers, could you please forward them to me? Yes, said Sean. I'll do that. Thank you. I'm sorry for any trouble I've caused. You didn't cause me any trouble, said Wren. And to reassure you, she said to Joe, I'm going to have Everett King and Robbie Truex stationed at the auditorium for the ceremony. Joe's eyes widened. Wren shrugged. Peace is good. Joe smiled. Thank you. Wren got in the jeep and called Everett. Everett, have you got your magic fingers to hand? Fingers, hand. See what I did there? I do, said Everett. What do you need? There's an old toy factory called the Osler Building, off Brighton Boulevard. It's in some way connected with Kurt Vine. He's posted photos of it on his site. Can you find out who owns it? Vine obviously doesn't, or you would have found out. But he has definitely been inside it, so he had to have keys or know someone who did. Unless it's not locked up, of course. I didn't think of that. Okay, I'll check that out and call you back. Did you talk to Gary? Gary? No, why? Apparently, you, Robbie, and Janine are staying after work for a meeting. Everyone else, including me, is to go home at five on the button. 
He said that was a strict order. Really? said Wren. What the heck is that about? She glanced at her phone. Oh, there's a text here from him. My office, 5.30 p.m., urgent. Woo! I have no idea, said Everett. I'm clearly not one of the chosen. I presume you added that woo yourself. Also, said Wren, before you flee at five on the button, I need you and Robbie to go right away to the auditorium in Denver University. It turns out that Sean Lucchese has been doing some very good amateur detective work that could have put him unwittingly in Duke Rollins' sights. Joe went ballistic. Shit, said Everett. Well, we don't know anything yet. It's precautionary, said Wren. I really don't believe he's in danger. On the drive, Wren thought about Duke Rollins watching her, knowing she was on the investigation, following her to her car, finding her and sitting next to her in bipolar support. A shiver ran up her spine. She was lucky. He had her right there. He could have done anything. She was lucky. For now. Ran pulled into Rhino and parked outside the man gym. She crossed the street and walked the two blocks to the Osler building. The building was constructed on different levels, all painted in the same palette of cream with bottle green trim. All the original signage had been removed from the exterior. The only signs left were keep out and private property. To the east side was the tallest part of the building, what Wren always thought was a chimney when she caught sight of it from the office. Up close, it looked like a small tower, albeit an adjoined one, twenty feet higher than the rest of the building. In the sixties, it had the timber doll's head mounted on the front. Without the head, it was clear that the line of small dark windows at the top had played the role of the teeth in the doll's smile. Not one bit creepy. There must be some kind of room up there. Ren walked around to the north side of the building, where there were eight shuttered loading bays. Give me a way in here, people. She googled the building. It wasn't up for sale or for lease, so there was no information or floor plans to be found. Shit. Her cell phone rang and she jumped. Everett, she said, answering. My heart. You need to set that thing to vibrate, said Everett. I hate vibration, said Wren. Pause. And yes, said Wren. All vibrations. Okay, I'm on my way to the university. Don't worry, he said. You were right about the building. I won't bore you with the details, but basically, when Kurt Vine inherited the land from his grandfather, his cousin inherited that factory warehouse. So it's not a big leap to say that Vine borrowed the keys to take the photos. That would explain how there were vintage photos on Vine's site, too. They were family photos. Where's the cousin? Germany, said Everett. Which means, unless Kurt Vine mailed the keys back, they're in his house in Sedalia. What's the significance of this building? said Everett. I'll fill you in when you get back, said Wren. Okay, said Everett. Are you up to badness? Never, said Wren. I'm going to call Douglas County. See if someone can look for those keys at Vine's house. But realistically, we both know that it is a giant lie and I'm going to break in myself. Chapter 62 Ren went around the side of the building and found a doorway with a glass upper half and a window beside it. She looked through into a narrow hallway tiled in pale green. She noticed a small crack in the pane. She looked left and right, saw no one, then struck the crack with her elbow. The glass was old and shattered easily. Wren covered her hand with her jacket, reached inside, and unlocked the door. She turned on her flashlight and went in. To the right, the door into the tower was padlocked. Ahead, an open door led into the main factory, 
and to the left was a long hallway and an old-fashioned sign over the architrave that read Administration. Ren started with the padlock door, yanking on it hard. Shit. She turned and went down the hallway. The air smelled of damp and paper and age. There were offices on both sides, all the way to the end. May find tools in offices. May break padlock. Maybe delusional. She pulled out a pair of gloves and put them on. As she walked, she moved her flashlight along the ground ahead, picking up the thin, threadbare carpet, stained for reasons she didn't want to consider. She directed the beam up and down the bare walls. She went through the first door on the left. Half-open file cabinet in the corner, single broken chair, missing desk, one poster, and marks on the wall from four missing ones. Why leave one? I never get that. What was so amazing about the other four? She went over to the file cabinet, pulled each drawer open wide. There were loose file tabs, an eraser, an orange ticket stub. In the bottom drawer, she found a lonely romance novel with an illustration of a handsome couple clutching each other as if the end of the world was just over the cover. That writer is dead now. She walked on, imagining the men and women who worked there, and she understood Kurt Vine and how he could want to honor people this way. Real people with lives and loves and families spent their days there with real hopes and dreams and problems and ambition. And then they died. Great. Imagine people coming into an abandoned safe streets. They'd find weird shit in my drawers. They'd question the whole operation. In the last office, Ren sat down at one of the desks and slid out the top drawer. There was a stack of 70s-looking brochures, the top one from a furniture company. She started flicking through it, then went to the next one. Stationery supplier, then the next one. Why am I so distracted? Jesus! She thought about the past and the present, and how tenuous everything felt, and how strange futures were, how they could turn from something bright into one big shit show, based on something as simple as an ordering or reordering of thoughts and the decisions that followed, or the words of a horoscope. She left the admin offices and went into the warehouse. It was at least 50,000 square feet contained under high ceilings, hung with fluorescent lights. Long, narrow tables were pushed back against the walls. Light filtered in dimly from the rows of window at the top of the wall. The floor was concrete, mainly dust-covered, but with trails where it had been disturbed. So someone was walking here recently, running. She looked around. Several someones. There was no sign that toys were ever made there. The bins from Kurt Vine's photos weren't here, and neither was the wooden doll's head. They may be about to put the building on the market. Ren's boot crunched over something. She looked down and saw broken glass in blue, green, clear. All the colors that were taken out of Donna Doris's feet. Yes, this is where Donna Doris was killed. The fucking horror of being hunted through this place. The flashlight picked up a dark stain on the concrete close by. There were more stains as they walked in further. She could smell bleach and urine, but it was a newer smell, not from as far back as Donna Doris's murder. Ren's heart started to beat a little faster. Relax, relax. She heard a sound behind her. Oh, fuck. She looked around. A man stood in silhouette in the doorway holding a tire iron. Joe. Thank fuck. What are you doing here? Said Ren, walking over to him. Didn't you wait for the graduation? I guess I'm not a great peacemaker. Jesus, it's his graduation. Joe shook his head. I couldn't stand by his side after what he did. I must sound like an asshole, and maybe I am. 
but I feel like a hypocrite. I'm even more anxious now to nail this son of a bitch while Sean is safe. Did you follow me? said Ran. Of course I did. I saw your eyes. You had something. You should have told me. I wanted you to go with Sean. Whatever this is can wait. And you believe that? said Joe. Have you spoken to Gary about this? Gary? No. Why not? Well, here I am, breaking and entering. She looked down. Joe was holding bolt cutters. Ren smiled. I thought that was a tire iron that I was about to be beaten to death with. Duke Rollins is not getting near you, said Joe. Ren went very still. I'm your do-over. You couldn't save Anna. You think you could save me. I'm not worried about Duke Rollins. You should be. But I'm fucking invincible. Now, are you done trying to scare the shit out of me in a darkened and abandoned warehouse? Because it's not working. Because I'm fucking invincible. Chapter 63 Joe pointed over to the row of doors on the opposite wall. Where do they go? They lead into the loading bays. Joe counted them. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. There were nine of them, said Joe. And there were only eight loading bays outside. So that room on the right over there has no external access. Let's start with that. They went over to the door. Joe broke the lock with the bolt cutters. Inside, a huge plastic lidded bin on wheels stood at the center of the room. With a gloved hand, Ren reached up to the handle on the lid and pushed it up. As soon as it opened a crack, they were hit with two smells. Cleaning fluid and death. Suppress the gagging. Give me a leg up, said Ren. Seriously? said Joe. Yes, he did. The liquid was murky, gray-green, stinking, and rising to the top, floating tips of blonde hair. That would be Danny Faraday, said Ren, sliding back down. And on and on it goes, said Joe. We should check the other doors, too, just in case, said Ren. They went through them, one to eight, and they were all cleared out. Ren's phone went off. She jumped. Joe laughed. It was a text from Janine. Where are you? Gary going apeshit. Ren checked the time. 5.38? Holy shit, where has the time gone? Ren texted Janine. Cover for me? In the middle of something. We'll be there in ten. It will be worth it. Janine replied, Call Gary first. Seriously. Please. Grrr. Ren called Gary. Ren, where the hell are you? He said. I'm on my way, said Ren. You're not going to believe this shit. The phone went dead. Oh my God. He hung up on me. That's bad. Really bad. But do not go back to him without proof. He will think you are insane. Again. She felt a surge of frustration, a rush of violent impulses she struggled to leash. They were terrifying, and they were powerful, and they were not meant for people like Gary. Shall we enter the tower? said Ren. After you, then. Joe smiled, gestured forward. Ran pointed to the tower door. He's been watching us from up there. What do you think he could really see? Said Joe. Honestly? Said Ren. Not a lot. I think it's psychological. I think it's a one-up thing. A fuck you. I don't think he's learned anything. How could he have? Joe used the bolt cutters on the padlock. He set it down. They both took out their flashlights, drew their weapons. 
Ran walked through, the concrete floor illuminated by the beams. Ugh, it stank of garbage. There were two empty bottles of bleach on the floor. This is it, said Ren. We found the monster's lair. She moved her flashlight and they struck the metal steps of a spiral staircase. Oh, God. The lighthouse. Ren could feel Joe pause behind her. She checked her phone, then turned to him. I've lost my signal, said Ren. Could you call Gary? Let him know? Send everyone in? I'm coming up, said Joe. Please don't, said Ren, setting her foot on the rock-solid bottom step. This staircase does not feel stable. It won't take both of us. She kept walking up. Call Gary. He won't take a call from me. Ren got to the top of the stairs. There were two mattresses on the ground, empty food cartons. The same kind of detritus that people everywhere collect just by going about their lives. She walked over to the window. She looked over at safe streets. She had a clear view. The bullpen was in darkness. Because they're all in Gary's office at an urgent meeting, where I should be. But I scored. He can't be mad. She looked around. Suitcases, clothes, girls, guys, Danny Faraday's guitar, makeup, syringes, band-aid, magazines, newspapers, razors, objects that echoed through so many lives but took on a filthy and sinister quality, strewn around the lair of a killer. Ren ran down the stairs. Did you get him? No, said Joe. It rang out. Everything's up there, said Wren. It's Rollins. Joe started to walk past her through the doorway. It's safe. Go ahead. I'll go, said Wren. I'll get everyone. She could hear Joe's footsteps clanging on the metal behind her, then fading as she ran from them. Wren got back into the jeep and drove the two minutes to the livestock exchange building. There were five cars in the parking lot, Gary's, Robbie's, Janine's, Everett's, and a fancy black sporty one. That car is familiar. Hmm. And why is Everett still here? She ran up the steps and paused. It was an overcast day, but the lobby seemed unnaturally dark. She pushed open the door into the lobby. She was hit with a smell. Oh, God. Someone is dead in here. Oh, Jesus Christ. Chapter 64 Ren's heart pounded. She drew her weapon and walked toward the stairs. In the gloom, she could see feet sticking out from under the stairwell. Oh, no. She walked over, hearing nothing but her own footsteps. The realtor, Valerie, dressed in her beautiful pink suit, was lying by the wall. There was a loose plug socket in her hand, its wires connecting it limply to the hole in the baseboard. She looked pristine, but she was clearly dead. Oh my God. The electricity. The fault. Rodney Vizel was right. What the fuck? Ren crouched down put her fingers to Valerie's throat. No pulse. Ran stood up, looked up, saw nothing. No lights on. The system is shorted. Gary didn't hang up. But why isn't everyone down here? Surely they would have come down to investigate. She took out her cell phone, started to dial 911. Ran! She looked up. Janine! Oh my God! What happened? Ren ran up toward her. I know, it's terrible, said Janine. We've already called 911. They're on their way. Ren ended the call, put her phone away, slid her sidearm into its holster. Are you okay? Is everyone else? We have our flashlights. 
Gary is insisting on finishing this meeting. What? Jesus, am I a dead woman walking? Said Wren. No, no, said Janine. She turned and ran up ahead. This is weird. She isn't making eye contact with me. Her tone is off. Wren made it up to the top floor and walked into the safe street's hallway. It was eerily quiet. Gary sent everyone home. Gary's office was at the end of the hallway, the door wide open. Empty. We're in here, said Janine. By the cells. Shivers were rolling down Wren's spine. Why aren't you all in Gary's office? Something's not right here. Janine sounds off. Why is she not looking at me? Wren took the right through the admin offices and the left into where the cells were. Oh, God. Duke Rollins had dragged a table into the center of the small space and was sitting on it, his arm hooked around Janine, who was now half leaning, half sitting on his right leg like a ventriloquist's dummy. There was an ethereal look of calm on her face, and a knife pressed against her neck, right to her carotid artery. I can't risk a shot. Janine, you look so tiny. Rollins gave Janine a squeeze. You did good. You did good. Your colleagues here lived. Wren glanced to her left, to the cells. Inside the one closest to the wall were Robbie and Everett. Inside the other, closest to her, was Gary. All of them with their wrists tied behind their backs with cable ties or handcuffs. Wren laid her weapon on the file cabinet beside her and raised her hands. I'll do whatever you want me to. I really fucking will. Everyone was looking at her. What do you want me to do? Said Wren. I want you to shut the fuck up. Said Duke. I need to think. Wren looked around the room. What can I do? What is open to me? I won't get someone harmed. Nothing. Yet. There was a small cardboard box on the table beside Duke. I got a box of ringing cell phones here, he said. People beginning to wonder where your asses are at. Unfortunately, y'all are always letting your people down, aren't you? Got called away on a case, found a suspect, chased a robber, got held hostage. He looked around, laughed a crazy laugh. Being unavailable doesn't really set off any alarm bells in your people's lives. He paused. Miss Wren Bryce, I'm going to have you come my way slowly. Place your keys and both your weapons in this box at my feet, and your cell phone right here in this box. Then you stand by the wall there, to my left, where I can see you. No false moves. No true ones. He picked up her phone right away. Now, let me have a look at this. Janine shifted on her feet. Duke yanked her close to him. Ren locked eyes with her. Stay as strong as you always are. You can do this. Wren looked over at Gary, Robbie, and Everett. They looked at her with unreadable expressions. How do we get out of this? Wren started looking around the room again. What is at my disposal? Agent Bryce, said Duke. You've got mail. Neiman Marcus wants to introduce you to a sneak preview of Spring's new line. He paused. Dear Misters Neiman and Marcus, thank you for your kind email, but I'm not going to even make it through fall, and even if I did, there'll be no spring in my step. He laughed. 
Agent Diddling, he said. We hoped you enjoyed your stay at the Hay Adams Hotel in Washington, D.C. Detective Truex, this is from your personal account. C.J., whoever that is, had a great night Saturday. Has been thinking about you ever since. Agent King, you need to renew your subscription to the New Yorker. He paused. Jesus, how much time do you people spend reading this bullshit every day? Beep, 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 you got mail. You got a whole pile of bullshit is what you got. Aren't you supposed to be fighting crime? The Hay Adams Hotel. Where have I come across that recently? Where? Written down somewhere. Gold letters. Sylvie Ross. Child forensic interviewer. Her sleek, stylish pencil with the gold writing. Hay Adams Hotel, D.C. Gary being standoffish, abandoning her abruptly in the bullpen. Oh, God. Gary is having an affair with Sylvie Ross. Sylvie fucking Ross. She looked at him, unable to hide her flinch. Of course, you have no idea what I just realized in the middle of all this. She looked back at Duke Rollins. Why are you here? There was another beep. Janine Hooks said Duke. Thank you for your donation to some beat-up dogs. He turned to Ren, his voice ice cold. Now, here's a question for you. Where the hell is Joe Lucchese? I'm not fucking around. Joe Lucchese has clearly gone off your radar, thank God. I don't think you're fucking around, said Wren. But Joe Lucchese has left Denver. You lying bitch. I'm not lying, said Wren. You can sit here looking for information I don't have, or you can go out and try and find him yourself. Oh, if Joe thinks his little lady is in trouble, he'll come looking for her, said Duke. He's a cop. I'm an agent, said Wren. He doesn't see me as a little lady who needs to be rescued. He might want to keep you alive to fuck you again, though, said Duke. Fuck, 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 fuck. I did not. She trailed off. Right now, Joe Lucchese is non-contactable. Check my phone. See his automatic reply. He will not be answering his emails. It's there, black and white. His phone is diverted. You know all this. You are here because of this. You've lost him. You want to draw him back. Duke was barely hiding his rage. And Joe Lucchese's priority is not me, said Wren. His priority is his family. Duke laughed. Well, I can at least reassure him that one member of his family is safe. What the fuck is that supposed to mean? Ren's heart plunged. She saw Grace's little face. That as long as I keep you here, Duke Rollins, in the same room as me, Grace Lucchese is absolutely safe. Then she thought of Joe Lucchese's own words. Duke Rollins will always have an accomplice. Chapter 65 Duke Rollins, his arm still around Janine's narrow waist, was now pulling her tight to him, her back against his stomach, the back of her head against his chest. She's the sweetest one here, isn't she? said Duke. I knew you'd run to her. He turned to Janine. She must think you're a little fragile. He picked up her skinny wrist, let it drop. Janine was staring ahead, jaw clenched, rock solid, no reaction. 
Go ahead, Rollins. Underestimate her. See what happens. Let the woman go, said Everett. Show some mercy. The Duke looked at him. Mercy. There was no mercy for me. My whole life. He reached out his arm. No mercy for me. And that makes me merciless. Mercy less. You don't need to just shut the fuck up or I'll kill both these women. I like doing that, remember? Why would I let the females go? They're what I love to do. You, he said, stabbing the gun into Janine's ribs. You take all these phones apart. You take out the SIM cards, batteries, everything. I'm watching you. Don't do anything stupid. I'm going to keep yours, Ren Bryce, so your savior can come and get you. Text him, he said, handing her the phone. Right, very simply, in your regular way, nothing fancy, nothing weird, to come to safe streets. Then show me. Ren wrote, Come to safe streets. She handed it to Duke. Add something else, said Duke. You really think that's enough, you dumb bitch? Right. Important development. She did as he asked. He hit send. I'll wait as long as that takes, he said. Of course, he might be more anxious to respond this time round, seeing that he fucked up with his wife. Or maybe he won't show at all, seeing that he fucked up with his wife. Janine did as Rollins asked, dismantling the phones, filling the box with her parts. Thank you kindly, said Duke. See, I can do things kindly. I can. How many women have you raped and murdered? He said, mimicking a whining female voice. Answer, I have lost track. He ran his forearm under his nose, wiped away sweat. Why have you lost track? Why? How could that possibly be? He raised his arm and looked around the room. I have lost track in the same way I lost track of... She looked at him. I know what you're thinking. Lost track of the number of times you were violated. I need to provoke you. I need you to come for me and let Janine go. She'll know what to do. If you lunge, she drops. The weapons are within her reach. You are no different to your mother, said Wren. An addict who hurts other people to soothe their own pain. He didn't move an inch. That's bullshit. That is bullshit. At least your mother was just addicted to disappearing into her own little screwed-up world. You're addicted to raping and killing your way out of it. What do you think your mother went through as a child that her pain went so deep? What that bitch went through, said Duke, his pitch rising. I don't care, as long as it was as close to hell as it could possibly be. I know why. And I understand how you could think that way. Duke was sweating. The temperature was stifling. Six people in a small space. No AC. I took her away, Mama Rollins, said Duke. He laughed. Mama, fuck me. I took her and I put her in a box. Danger. Keep out. It was a hole in it I made her watch through so she could see the effect she had on me. I used to sing her dainty song. Danny never even knew I'd disappear after where I kept Mama. He held out his arms. I raked that hooker right in front of her face. Saw her beady eyes looking out. Killed her there, too. Burned her flesh to hide her wounds. Win-Win was her name. 
and I swear to God, no truer name for what I was doing. Win, fucking win. Oh, Mama knew what she'd done. She knew what she'd done to me. I left that night to get rid of that bye by the hour hook of corpse, and Wanda Rollins got away. Bye bye. I've been doing so well. I was very angry that Kurt found her. Very angry with him. But he didn't know who the fuck she was. He was thinking about boning that blonde. Got there first. He laughed. Positions of trust. That's what it's called, right? That was what my mama was in, right? That's what you guys are in. A shiver went up Ren's spine. The profile. The obsession with positions of trust. This is his red-hot danger zone. Where was the trust in my life? Said Duke. Who could I trust if I couldn't trust my own mama? He turned to Gary. I see you. Supervising all this. Making streets safe. I see all of you. And I'm thinking, when was I ever safe? He raised his gun. Where were the safe streets for me to walk? He laughed. You're not safe. You are not safe. He fired twice. The first bullet hit Robbie, a clean shot to the head. The second hit Everett. Ren could see his hair lift into the air, then blood spraying. Then he was slumped behind Robbie. Robbie's lifeless eyes stared ahead. The side of his head was destroyed. Next in line, spattered with his colleague's blood, staring down a barrel, was Gary Detling. Chapter 66 No! Robbie! Everett! No, 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 no! That's not how it works. You give chances. You give people chances. You... Wait. You fucking wait. You let us save people, you fucking psycho. You fucking psychopath. No, 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 no! Agent down. Agent down. Agent down. Agents down. Agents down. Janine was ghostly, her lip quivering, her body limp. But her eyes were set, dark, glued to the opposite wall. Duke was now pointing the gun at Gary, staring him down. Gary was staring right back, unmoving, waiting, calm, accepting. I thought you were merciless, said Wren, drawing Duke on herself. Gary has a wife. Gary has a daughter. You just shot two men said Wren. Dead in an instant. No suffering. Don't you want people to suffer? Where's the suffering in an instant death? Duke blinked. Seconds passed. He lowered the gun a fraction, moved it to the right, fired, ripping a chunk from Gary's left triceps. The blood spattered up against Wren's right side. She could feel the warm spray on her face. Jesus Christ. Gary cried out in pain, only briefly, then buried it. Ren's fingers shook as she wiped Gary's blood from her face. I'm next. Jesus Christ. No, don't. Please don't. Don't. Duke, instead, had pulled Janine back tight against him, and his gun was pressed into her ribs. Oh, no. No. Ren was immediately seeing row after row of crime scene photos, and everyone was dead. And this time, they had the faces of her friends. No, no, no! Imagine an abandoned safe streets. Jesus Christ! What hell are we in? Stop, stop, stop! Think, think, think. Think, think, think. Get out of this room. We need to get out of this room. Duke Rollins' nickname as a child was Pukey Dukey. It tormented him. That's what Sean Lucchese said. 
throw up. It will rattle him. Please, said Wren. Please, can we move into another room? I can't. I don't feel well. The smell of everything. I think I'm going to be. You shut the fuck up, said Duke. Just shut the fuck up. I'm going to be. Raped in front of your boss is what you're going to be. Ren fell to her knees in front of Duke and threw up, splashing his boots. Silver spots danced in front of her eyes. Ugh. You fucking disgusting piece of shit, said Duke. He jumped out of the way, staggered back, kicking out, catching her in the jaw. Ren cried out, fell onto her side, curled into a ball. Get the fuck up, he said. She stood up, slowly. My jaw. The pain. Duke was now pressing the gun into Janine's temple. You, he said to Ren. Walk, carefully, slowly toward the door. I've got your friend. Don't be dumb. Ren moved toward the door, glancing back at Gary. Oh, fuck. No. His face was gray, his arms soaked with blood, his head limp on his neck. When Duke Rollins saw Gary's face, he lit up. I'm gonna leave you here. Leave you to go slowly. Ren stopped. Please let me help him, she said. You will need him if you want to get away from here. He's in charge. He'll get... Who says I want to get away from here? Said Duke. Who says this is not my blaze of fucking glory? You do want to get away, said Wren. You have to want to get away. You do need someone. You've always needed someone. Gary will get you whatever you want. Now, why would he do that? Said Duke. Do you think I'm stupid? In exchange for his life, Gary would do anything, said Wren. Gary managed a weak nod. Jesus, please don't die. Jesus, this is not happening. Someone tell me this is not fucking real. And what about you? Said Duke, turning to Wren. What would you do? His eyes glowed in the darkest, deadest way. Ren's heart pounded. Me? What would I do? His hand was on his belt buckle. Her stomach turned. I'd like to see you try. Move, he said. Move! Ren walked through the offices out into the hallway, Duke behind her, gripping Janine. In there, said Duke, pointing into the conference room. Ren opened the door into a room that was filled with everything there was to know about Duke Rollins and his life, and his victims and theirs. His eyes widened. This is pretty obsessive, he said. That's what he says. He cuffed Janine to the radiator. Ren expected to be next. You're coming with me, he said. By the ladies' room. What? Why? She glanced down at Janine. They locked eyes. It was too much. At least if he's with me, Janine is safe. Move, said Rollins. Now. He rattled his belt buckle. He shoved Wren down the hallway ahead of him. As she walked, she did a mental inventory of every room in safe streets, scanning their contents from memory wondering what a man like Duke Rollins would use to rape her. He always used whatever was to hand. I am deciding what object I will be raped with. Her stomach tightened. Choose the source of your wildest pain. This is all so wrong. Duke pushed the door open and shoved her into the ladies' room. He planted her at the sink in front of the mirror, stood behind her. She could smell his skin, shower gel, laundry detergent, mouthwash, nothing as filthy or stinking as it should be. 
she gripped the edges of the sink. She stared, not at him in the mirror, but at herself. How many times have I looked at this face? and hated who I saw, and was disappointed, and was guilty, and felt ruined, nothing, useless, a failure. She felt a surge of strength. Bring it on, psycho, bring it on. I will fucking kill you. I am more than you think I am. I am more than I think I am. She got a flashback to the previous year, to the teenage boy, the rapist who had fought her, brought her to the ground until Denver PD detectives had burst in. Not this time. I'm stronger, fitter, murderous. You have all the power, said Wren. Duke tilted his head. You don't need to rape me to prove that, said Wren. Maybe that's not why I want to rape you, he said, running his hand up her stomach. What the fuck? You think I'm a monster, don't you? He said. You think I'm a monster. Wren didn't reply. Little Miss Perfect's never sinned, he said. He grabbed a thick fistful of her hair, pulled it taut brought fresh tears to her eyes, then slammed her head into the mirror, cracking it, yanking her back again, slamming her head in again. So you can face yourself. No shame, right? He said. The skin was split above Wren's eyebrow. She watched the blood stream down the left side of her face. Seven years, bad luck. One night down. Can you, said Wren, can you face yourself? Duke looked up at his distorted reflection in the broken glass. For a wild moment, uprooted from reality, Wren was expecting humanity. All she saw were eyes that were black, blank, terrifying. Dead in one way, alive in another. She felt a slow shiver roll from the base of her spine to the top of her head. This man is the devil incarnate. I'm not going to make it out of here. Chapter 67 Wren's heart was pounding. Where are you, Joe? Did you get my text? You had to have realized it wouldn't take us this long to get back. Maybe the tower, the steps, the lighthouse. It was all too much. It was another lifetime. A bigger nightmare. An overwhelming one. Duke started unbuttoning her shirt. No, no, no. She squirmed under his hands. No, don't. He laughed, opened the buttons even slower. When he was down to the third one, her cell phone beeped. Thank God. Thank God. Please, please let him look. Please. He took the phone, stared at the screen. An email, he said. Sean Banner. Copied to Joe Lucchese. Sean Lucchese? No. It's the names of Duke's abusers. No. Oh, no. Don't read that email, said Wren. Don't read it. Please don't. It's not in your interest to... She watched in the shattered mirror as Duke started to read. He blinked. Twice. And Wren thought of the broken doll's eyes and the nightmares and the pale blue glass. He blinked again. He was scrolling down. He was still scrolling. Oh, God. How many names are on that list? His whole body started to tremble. He kept swallowing over and over. We can get justice for you, said Wren. Duke turned to her, squinted. Justice for me? Wesley Ames, said Wren. Duke was struggling to keep control of his facial muscles. 
I know Police Chief Ogden Parnham is dead, said Wren, but we can bring the others to justice. All those men. We can make sure that they rot in jail for what they did. Duke was looking around the room. I have no idea what you are thinking right now. So you know all my dirty little secrets, said Duke. That's not what this is, said Wren. It wasn't your fault. Don't you want to... No! He roared. No! He yanked her toward him. She could feel his breath on her ear. Which one's your locker? He said. Which one? Oh, shit. What's even in there? Ren pointed to her locker, and he dragged her to it, opened it, and pulled out her wash bag. What the? They were back at the sink. He dropped the wash bag into it. He unzipped it and frantically searched through it. What are you looking for? I don't want to think. He pulled out her toothbrush. What is he doing? He pulled out the toothpaste. He took the bag and threw it across the floor. He released her waist, but grabbed her hair again, pulled it tight, held her head over the sink. He squeezed toothpaste onto the brush. He turned on the cold faucet with a shaking hand. Open your fucking mouth, he said. Open your mouth. Open your mouth. He pulled up her hair. Open your mouth. She did as he asked. He shoved the toothbrush under the water, then shoved it into her mouth and started scrubbing hard. I am gone, I am gone, I am gone. I always had a filthy mouth, he said. Always had to scrub at it, always. And if I couldn't, if I couldn't get to brush my teeth, if I was in school or the toothpaste was all gone and I had no money to buy any more, you know what? I preferred the taste of puke. Jesus Christ. He scrubbed and scrubbed and scrubbed Wren's teeth until her gums bled. She was choking on the toothbrush, gagging, and he kept brushing. You know what I did with my few cents, he said, when all the other kids were buying candy? I was buying toothpaste. Wren coughed over and over until eventually he stopped. He shoved her head under the cold faucet and the water poured over her mouth and she sucked it in and it burned like acid and she spat it out and he pulled her head up again. Her gums were throbbing, her scalp on fire. He threw her down on the bench by the wall where she sat slumped back. And then something happened that she could never have imagined. Duke Rollins dissolved into tears. Did I stand a chance? He said, wiping his eyes. Did I? Did I? If you have a mother as fucked up as mine, and a father who's what? A whore fucking vanishing act? What kind of blood's gonna be running through your veins? How did I stand a chance? You didn't, said Wren. You really didn't. Do you know my mother allowed men into my bedroom, said Duke. Knocked on their behalf. A weak and shameful pussy's knock. Knocking. As if there was an option. There was no safe place for me. Like every other kid, I'd make those homemade signs saying, Keep out and danger, do not enter. What your mother did to you was sick, unconscionable. Do you know? He roared over her. I'm sorry. His voice returned to normal. Did my mother allow groups of men to take me away to their cabins in the woods? They'd tell their wives or whoever the hell they had back home that they were going hunting. And they were hunting me. Through the woods. And I had to show up in school Monday like nothing had happened. 
like no one had handed me over to a pack of wild animals Friday night for a gram of coke. He stuck his neck forward, opened his eyes wide, like a threat, like a challenge. Of course, it didn't matter who caught me. They all got a piece of me in the end. He looked at Ren. Thing is, there weren't really any pieces. Someone like you might think I'm a broken man, but I'm not. You can't be broken if all of you has been gone since you were about seven years old. That's the fact of the matter. I didn't know until I was seven years old that what was happening to me didn't happen to most other kids. Oh, God. This is just so heartbreakingly, terrifyingly, chillingly fucked up. Do you think I trust law enforcement after what a sheriff did to me? Came to me in his pristine uniform. Came on me in his pristine uniform. Used his baton. Anything. Everything. No, sir. And he wasn't the only man in uniform to come to my door. So you can all go fuck yourselves. Bet you have birthday parties and comfort, comfort in your life. I had nothing. For the first four years of my life, I could feel happiness, joy. And after that, I could feel only pain. And after that, nothing until my one friend. I had one friend that Joe Lucchese killed and lied to me about, told me he was cheating with my ex-wife, lying son of a bitch. I almost believed him, but it was just another load that someone expected me to swallow. And it was almost the worst part. Almost worse than him killing Donnie was him trying to shit on Donnie's memory. Do you know what's so terrible? If you're like me, and you know nothing good in your life, and you're numb to all pain, but then something happens that makes you feel good, or someone comes along that makes you feel good, well, that's a fucking miracle. That's what that is. It's the most precious thing in the world. And Joe Lucchese took all that away. And I have made him pay. And I will make him pay some more. Shit on the memory of a rapist murderer. You and Donnie Riggs killed women together, said Wren. Which also makes me feel good, said Duke. Don't you fucking get that by now? Jesus Christ. But it's not the same without him. It just isn't, said Duke. I fuck up without him. Always have. I don't get the same 100% joy I did from when he was with me. That was taken from me. The last bit of good. He slammed his fist into the mirror, and the phone dropped to the floor. Where the fuck is Joe Lucchese? Where is he? He pulled back, blood streaming down his knuckles. I told you, he's not in Denver, said Rem. I don't believe you, said Duke. I don't believe you. She glanced down at the phone, still open on the email from Sean, and there were just so many names. Duke bent down, picked it up, held it right up to her face, and scrolled through it. They were numbered. Her heart lurched. Sixty-three names. Chapter 68 Duke looked down at Wren. Have you ever met someone like me before? Wren shook her head. No. And what do you make of me? Wren looked into his eyes. I have no words. You know, I wonder if you pity me, said Duke. And I can't say that that's not what I want because I think somewhere inside me, 
There's a little boy who wants it. He has to still be there, doesn't he? Because who else can still feel the thrill of seeing a hawk in flight? Or the smooth surface of a creek waiting to be dived into? Or because it's not me? He looked away. I get different thrills. He paused. But maybe it's not the calm of the creek water. It's the need to shatter it. It's the need to break that perfect surface. Maybe that's what it is. What do I make of you? What do I make of you? You make me want to kill every person on earth who has ever harmed a child. And after what you've done, which I have to keep thinking about, after what you've done, you make me want to kill you. He looked at her as if he was reading her mind. Never be too comfortable in your skin, he said. Never. Never think you're better than everyone else. Never look at other people and judge. Because, you know the fucking tragedy of humanity? A lot of us give in to things we hate, don't we? Danny did. She was disgusted by our mama, and I watched her become our mama. Dainty might not have been a hooker, but she was a mean, junky bitch. Wrote a song about mama. Ended up making it her own fucking anthem. Ended up dancing to it. Ended up dying to it. Be careful what you choose to dance to. All Rand could think about was Everett. My darling dancing Everett. Let me help you with this said Ren. With what happened to you? He didn't even look up. You don't want to help me. Shut the fuck up. You can't manipulate me. I'm not stupid. I'm here. I've got your boss in a cell. Your friend chained to a radiator. I told you how you can help me. Get Joe Lucchese here. I can't do that, said Wren. If I could, I would. Her phone beeped again. Another email. He opened it. He looked alarmed. Not like the last time. This is different. What the fuck is going on here? Two emails. Relevant to him? How does this work? Said Duke. I want to reply to this one. He sat down beside her. The email address was luckynypd67 at gmail.com and the subject, Jeff Riggs. What the hell is this? Donald Riggs's father, the subject of an email to me? Okay, Joe was NYPD. 67 is his birth year. Lucky, short for Lucchese. His personal email address? What has he sent me? What about Jeff Riggs? She looked down. It was a two-line email. We found something. Jeff Riggs is Duke Rollins' biological father. Only problem is, he's dying. We're gonna question him before it's too late. And frankly... I don't give a fuck if he has a heart attack right there in the bed. Joe. Holy shit. What the? This is off. Even for Joe, that last line sounds extreme. She hit reply and nodded toward the box. You type in there. Duke grabbed it back from her and slowly input his response. Then he sat against the wall, wiped his hand across his brow let out a breath. He was holding Wren's cell phone in his hands. He didn't take his eyes off the screen. Where is he? What has Duke replied? Will Joe get it? Why am I still alive? Wren touched her hand to her face. Still bleeding. It's a waiting game now, said Duke, more to himself than to anyone else. 
Jeff Riggs is Duke Rollins' father? That means Joe Lucchese has been upgraded to the killer not just of Rollins' friend, but of his only brother. And he's saying they're sending people to question a dying man? This will not end well. Chapter 69 There was a sudden rattling groan from downstairs, a creaking sound, more rattling. Sounds like the elevator, but it's not working. Who is about to walk into this nightmare? Jesus Christ, the haunted elevator. Maybe that's all it is. Duke grabbed Wren. He took her flashlight from his back pocket, hustled her out the door, and used it to light their way out onto the landing. Duke shouted, his voice echoing around the stairwell. If someone is down there trying to fuck with me, it ain't gonna work. I'm gonna fire into this little lady's face if I see even a flicker of movement out of the corner of my eye. Who's here? Please be Joe. There was a banging sound, loud and hollow. That's the basement door. The basement door is open. A cell phone started to ring in the foyer, echoing on the marble, its screen glowing. Wren listened, looked all around her, studied everything as Rollins moved the flashlight's beam all across the stairs, up and down. All at once, pieces started to fall into place. A plan. That phone will have to be answered said Wren, so as not to cause suspicion. That lady you killed. Valerie, the realtor. You were buying the electrical fault then, said Duke, laughing out loud. He sighed. That was a good one, though. I saw the electrical contractor's van last week. I figured it was a nice trap. Arranged to meet Valerie here. Arranged a little water on the outlet, got her to check it out, told her I heard there was a problem in the building. You are insane. Valerie has a jumpy boss, said Wren. If she hasn't checked in for hours, he will send someone here if she doesn't pick up. He will call one of us, and if none of us answers, and her last appointment was here... Duke shrugged, but he started to move her forward. The phone kept ringing. If you don't let me answer that, this will fuck everything up for you. We just walk down there. I pick up, say she's in the ladies' room, no big deal. We're done. I need you on the second floor. Duke switched off the flashlight, gripped Ren in front of him, fully protecting his body. They made it down two flights, but instead of going down, Duke moved them around to the left by the guardrail so they could look down to where Valerie lay. The phone stopped ringing. The sound that replaced it was the slow approach of footsteps. From under the stairs, a figure emerged. Joe Lucchese. He walked up the stairs with his hands in the air. Well, here he comes, said Duke, to rescue his little lady. He's not here for me, said Wren, and we both know that. Joe kept walking up. Duke didn't stop him. We need to talk, said Joe. We sure do, said Duke. Joe kept walking up, hands in the air, unarmed, apparently. He walked halfway up the second flight. Why has Rollins not shot him already? Joe made it up to the top. He moved around. There were only six feet between them. Duke squeezed Wren tightly, stepping back a few feet. Go back further, said Wren. Get out of his reach. Go toward that door at the end. It leads outside onto the back of the building. You can take my car. Joe doesn't give a fuck about me or my colleagues. He wants you. He will kill you. I want you to leave. I just want Gary and Janine to be safe. If you leave now, you'll get to see your father. Before they get to him. If you stay, Joe will kill you. 
What the fuck are you saying, Ren? Said Joe. That's why he's here, said Ren. It's the only reason. Rollins, you came here not knowing who your father is. Now you know. Everything's changed. You need to get out of here alive. You need to see your father. Duke moved down the hallway. Is there a key to that door? He said, glancing back. No, said Ren. It's open. You can just go. Joe started moving toward them. Fuck you, Ren. Stay back, said Ren. Stay the fuck away from us. Ren took in the scene. Joe Lucchese was three feet from her. Duke Rollins was behind her with his arm around her, his hip up against the guardrail. Ren thought of boxing, one of the best defensive moves, bob and weave. She thought of Paul Louderback and the focus mitts, how he swiped them over her head, how she had to come up quickly to punch them again. Straight jab, bob, weave. Jab, bob, weave. There was an eerie silence. Joe lunged toward them. Duke wasn't holding Ren tightly enough. She was no longer useful. He didn't see her as a threat. He didn't see any woman as a threat. Ren did it. She dropped so quickly, compressed her body, came out from under Duke's arm and spun around so she was facing him again, Joe beside her. Duke lost his balance, slammed hard into the guardrail. They heard the sound of wood cracking. Everything felt suspended. Then, the guardrail broke. Duke started to teeter. He dropped the gun, reached out. Ren's arm shot out to pull him back. Joe's arm shot out. There is something wrong here. In a fraction of a second, Duke gripped Ren's arm. As she tried to lean backwards to pull him in, but he was heavy and she was light, and Joe seemed to be doing none of the work. What the fuck are you doing? Jesus Christ, if Duke goes, I go too. Joe! Screamed Ren, yanking him out of whatever dark place he had gone to. Joe! She was sliding toward the edge of the broken balcony. No, no, fuck, no! Joe lunged for her, grabbed her waist, brought his forearm down hard to break the grip Duke had on her, pulled her backwards, and they both crashed onto the floor. There was a bare second of silence before Duke Rollins hit the first floor landing, then rolled down onto the marble floor below. Chapter 70 Joe and Ren quickly jumped up from the floor and ran down the stairs to where Duke Rollins lay on his back, his arms splayed out to the side, his head facing away from the glass entry doors. There was a small pool of blood under his head. Joe and Ren locked eyes. He's still alive. Duke managed to turn his head to look at Joe. Would you have told me about Jeff Riggs? Did it kill you that Donnie Riggs was my brother? Turns out I had a good family, Joe. I had a good family. So fuck you. Drunkard father, serial killer brother. So much goodness. I have no idea who your father is, said Joe. He shook his head, a lazy, taunting movement. Then he smiled. Duke frowned. But that email Ren was sent, said Joe. It was bullshit. It wasn't from me. It was copied to me, but it was sent from one of the agents right inside this building to stop you wanting to die, to stop your suicide mission. He knew you wouldn't want to leave this world without saying goodbye to your father, would you? Jeff Riggs was a kind man to you, but that's all he was. It wasn't your father. Who knows who your father could have been? Your mother had quite the list. We lost count of the possibilities. Everyone knew someone who knew someone who fucked your mama. Ease up, Joe. Ren watched Duke Rollins. He was smiling. His head lolled away again. Why are you still smiling? 
So, you can die with that mystery, said Joe. Who's yo daddy? Ren looked at Joe. There was a chilling menace in his face. Duke used all the strength he had to turn back toward them. Did you get my gift? said Duke. He was talking to Joe. The one I gave to the widow Ditling. No, Gary will not die. He will not die, you fucking psychopath. The FedEx slip, said Joe. What was I supposed to do with that? Read it. I did read it. What does it say to you? said Duke. Nothing, said Joe. What's it meant to say to me? You went through my garbage and stored up that information for years? For what? Duke laughed weakly. No, sir. It's the kind of shit that could give a man nightmares for the rest of his life. I'm so tired of this bullshit, said Joe. It's over. It's over now. Duke Rollins was weakening. His eyes were closing. Still, he was smiling. You don't get it, said Duke, staring up at Joe. You still don't get it. Get what? said Joe. Grace, said Duke. She's gone away, said Joe. Grace is safe. He looked at Wren, almost rolled his eyes. Safe like Haley Gray was, said Duke. Haley Gray was the little girl that Donald Riggs killed. Safe like Haley Gray with a bomb strapped around her waist and a detonator. There's no bomb strapped to my daughter. That I know for sure, said Joe. She is thousands of miles away, and only I know where. Your confidence is so complete. You know Grace is safe. You know it. Why is the energy in the room unchanged? Why do I still think Duke Rollins is holding all the cards? I'm the bomb, said Duke. You don't get it. I'm the bomb. With the last of his strength, his head was now rocking from side to side, smiling wider, blood smeared across his teeth and gums. This guy is absolutely unhinged. I'm the bomb, said Duke, and I am right there with Grace wherever she goes. I'm the bomb. I'm the bomb. Ren and Joe locked eyes, confused, disturbed. You still don't get it, said Duke. I got Grace. Grace got me. Got me running through her veins. He stopped his crazy rocking, stopped dead. His eyes burned into Joe Lucchese. I'm the daddy, said Duke. I'm the daddy. I fucked your wife. Lucky number seven years ago. I drugged her. I fucked her. I cleaned her up. I lay her down gently on the sofa where she spent most of her time anyway. I drugged her. I fucked her. And I gave her a baby. What are the fucking chances of that? I gave her grace. I gave your wife grace. Now, isn't that something? Oh, dear God. Chapter 71 Joe Lucchese's face had transformed in such a powerful way, it cut short even Duke Rollins' laughter. This is beyond thinking about. 
This is beyond all levels of depravity. Ren and Joe locked eyes. What are you thinking? How are you thinking? Ren's heart pounded. You want to kill this man. I want to see him rot in jail. Joe's face was desolate, his eyes empty. A nothing-to-lose air radiated from him. Duke Rollins is ready to die now. He wants to die. You want to kill him. I want to see him rot in jail. Ren looked at Duke. His shaven head was slick with sweat. Wanted. Wanted to see him rot in jail. Now? Now I want to kill this man. She stared at Joe. I want to kill this man for the lifelong pain he has caused you. You were a good man. You are a good man. What justice brought Duke Rollins into your life? Duke Rollins was looking around. He was smiling wide, but he couldn't hide the fear that was sparkling in his eyes. He kept smiling, though, and the smile broadened. He began laughing again, harder, louder, with depthless cruelty. That was not fear in your eyes. It was relish. You are getting an even better reaction than you expected. You have run this moment through your head a million times. And the moment is here. This is everything to you. There was no fear. Of course there wasn't. There was simply joy. There was a palpable change in the air. A thickening. A dense, choking, smoking hell. In my own way, said Duke, drawing out the words. I guess. I killed your wife. I did it. In my own way, I finished her off with all that scar tissue I left her. Guess I really am the gift that keeps on giving. The gift I always promised you I would be. He rolled his head to the side and spat out blood. Ren looked up at Joe. What are you going to do? What are you going to say? Joe muttered something. Ran waited. He muttered again. She strained to hear. Liar, said Joe a little louder. Liar. You're a fucking liar. Duke Rollins shook his head slowly. I'm not. I mean, I couldn't have planned for the baby. That was a happy accident. Soon as I saw Grace walking, though, I knew. She couldn't have been more than two years old in that park near your house. I saw it. She had the same skinny bow legs I had. Got passed down by my mama. Didn't you even wonder about her hair? I mean, you fucking liar, said Joe. You liar! No, said Duke. No. I caught it all on video. There's a date on it and everything. Like the FedEx slip I took while I was there. You'll see. That about match up to nine months before Grace was born. And yes, there's video evidence. He checked his watch. The matinee should be starting right about now. Sean Lucchese was staring at his laptop. He had pressed play on the emailed video, but the screen was still black. He waited. He recognized the steps up to their old house in Bay Ridge. The door was green like it used to be. This looked like an old video. Was this some kind of joke from one of his friends? Was someone about to egg the house or something? He could see the camera move onto the front door of the house, 
then slide across to the front room window. He could see the shadow of his mom moving about behind the gauzy curtains. His heart lurched at the sight of his mother. He missed her. Then he was watching the side of the house, the air vent that went into the living room. He could see a hand doing something there, holding something up, letting it waft in through the vent. The camera was back on the window. Sean could see the blurred form of his mother slump to the floor. He could hear footsteps as the person holding the camera walked up to the front door. He could hear keys jangling. Whoever was filming took the keys and shook them in front of the screen. It was a man's hand. Sean recognized his own key ring, remembered losing his keys and his fake ID on a night out in a bar. The man unlocked the front door. Sean's heart pounded as the man made his way into the living room. He crouched down beside his mother. He rolled her over onto her back. She was passed out, looked almost lifeless. There was no effort required to move her. The man started to push up her skirt. Sean slammed the laptop shut. Joe Lucchese's cell phone rang. He pulled it out of his jacket pocket. Sean's name was flashing like an alarm on the screen. The Duke was staring up at the ceiling. Without even turning his head, he said, that's got to be Sean. I'm sure he's in a real panic right about now, after what he's just watched. Jesus Christ. Joe was speechless, unmoving. Joe, said Wren. Joe. She reached out for his forearm. Look at me. Please look at me. Look at me. Duke was half laughing, half whining. Ignoring your only biological child? Joe fell to his knees, grabbing Duke Rollins by the neck. No, said Wren, diving after him. No, don't do this. He fell. He fell. You were not responsible. This, you will be responsible. He's not worth it. I can't even say, think of grace. Jesus Christ. Sean, Everything is so wrong. Joe had a white-knuckle grip on Duke's neck. I am going to fucking kill you. I will fucking kill you, you sick fuck. You fuck. You... Duke's eyeballs were bulging, his face bright with compressed blood, the heels of his boots scrambling on the marble floor. The pool of blood under his head was spreading. Ran tried to grab Joe's shoulders. It was like grabbing rock. His muscles were rigid, boring every ounce of strength into choking the life from Duke Rollins. Don't, said Wren. He's dying, Joe. He's dying. Let him die. Let him die. We'll walk out of here. We'll let him die alone. Let's leave him here to die. He can't win. Don't let him win. Joe stopped moving. Arms still rigid, he looked up at Wren, his eyes crazed, desperate, questioning. Sweat pouring down his face, his eyes stinging with it. His look said, Please tell me this is not the nightmare I believe it to be. There is a monster dying at your feet and living on inside your beautiful daughter. This is the nightmare you believe it to be. There was a flash of movement outside the building. Joe pulled his bloodied hands from Duke Rollins' neck and fell back onto his heels. Duke sucked in as big a breath as his failing body would allow. Wren grabbed Joe's arm as he stood up to his full height. Side by side, they watched, dazed, as the doors burst open and the SWAT team plowed in. Wren looked down. Duke Rollins looked delirious, his head moving again from side to side. He was drawing his final breaths, his face set into one final shit-eating grin. Chapter 72 Wren sat in the car outside Joe Lucchese's hotel, her forehead pressed against the steering wheel. Gary was at the hospital, in no position to tell her to go home, 
not to carry out the courtesy of seeing Joe off at the airport after some of the most horrific moments of his life. Fifteen hours had passed. Everyone focuses on the shooting, never the aftermath, never the ordinary stuff like people need to eat dinner, sleep, catch a flight somewhere. Ren checked her cell phone. There were four missed calls from Matt. She didn't listen to his voicemails, but she guessed he had read about the shooting online. All she managed to do was text him back, I'm fine, don't worry. She tried Ben's phone. She had left three voicemails. Surely he had heard. She'd never wanted to see him as much as she wanted to see him now. Maybe he found out about the night in the hotel with Joe. But he couldn't have. How could he have? Maybe he's on his way. Maybe he's going to be at the apartment when I get back. Surprise! She thought about Robbie. Robbie will never get married, or have kids, or love, or be loved the way he always wanted to be, the way he deserved. One last girl emailed him. Maybe she was going to be the one. Maybe Janine was. We won't ever know. Everett's widowed father will never know that Luke, Everett's handsome, beautiful, carpenter friend, who fell apart when he came to the hospital, was really the man Everett had loved for fifteen years and planned to spend the rest of his life with. What is to be done with all this grief? I can't bear this. I can't. I just can't. There is no cure. I don't believe in time. What can time do for me, Everett? You're the numbers guy. What will it take before I can dance again? Will time make me laugh? Or carry me double vodka cranberries? Or find me miracles in spreadsheets? Or laughs on Monday mornings? And ice for my pineapple juice? She started crying. I can't live this way. The horror outside. The horror inside. The thoughts. All the thoughts over and over. I want silence. I want to be the person who has one thought a day. An unchallenging thought. I want a mind where avenues are really dead ends. No forked thoughts. No networks. No links. But is that what I want? Is it? Who would I be then? She dialed Ben's number again. Ben, it's me. I'm not sure if you've heard anything, but please just call me first before you speak with anyone else. I love you so much. She hung up. My gut was right about some things, and my gut was wrong. This is so exhausting. Everyone has a gut they can go on, and I don't. Mine is broken. What am I supposed to do? What am I supposed to do about anything? Who can even answer that? Ren called Janine. Hey, she said. How are you doing? Numb, she said. Numb. Tell me what happened. The email, everything. Don't cuff me to something in a room full of documents, for one, said Janine. I just kicked over every pile I could, and eventually a paperclip slid my way. I uncuffed myself, ran in to check on Gary. He was unconscious. I thought he was dead. Everett... Everett was still alive, Ren. He was still alive. He told me Gary had a second phone for Sylvie Ross. I went to find Gary's phone in his office, somewhere in a drawer. I got it. I ran back to Everett. He told me to write an email pretending I was Joe. Told me about Jeff Riggs. He knew it would change things. 
she started crying. When I got back to him, he... He asked me to call his parents and hold the phone up. Then Luke... And... Ren... It was the worst. It was beyond heartbreaking. And Robbie was dead. And Everett was dying. And I was right there. And... She started bawling, crying. Ren sobbed along with her. Everett, in your dying moments, that's what you did made sure Duke Rollins would want to live, would be more likely not to want to die in a hail of bullets and take everyone with him. Everett, Janine, you saved my life. You saved Gary's. And Gary, your affair helped. Jesus Christ. Where are you? said Wren. Are you home safe? Yes. Terry's on her way over. Will you come when you're ready? Of course I will. Of course. Never in my wildest dreams did I think I would be meeting Terry under these circumstances. Ren looked up to see Joe Lucchese walking down the steps. She pushed open the driver's door and started to get out of the jeep. Hey, she said. Hey, said Joe. Stay where you are. Let me just throw this in the back seat. Where I looked back at your sleeping daughter not that long ago. The drive to the airport was mostly in silence. Two ghostly, grieving people with black memories, shared secrets, deep sufferings, uncertain paths. Scars upon scars. I don't want any more war stories. I don't want any more war. She could see only Duke Rollins, Robbie, Everett, Gary. Where the fuck am I? She was struck with an image of Dr. Gaston holding a putty knife. She heard his brutal words from an old crime scene. Dries like concrete. What was he talking about? Where the fuck am I? Rollins, Robbie, Everett, Gary, Rollins, Robbie, Everett, Gary. Gun, blast, holes, blood, gray matter, gray matter, gray matter, dries like concrete, dries like concrete, dries like concrete. I need to pull over, said Wren. I'm going to be sick. Oh, God. Oh, God. Oh, God. The car was parked for twenty minutes. Wren lay, weakened, slumped in the seat. Joe gave her space and silence. I'm so tired. I'm so, so tired. I can't do this. I'm cracking. I'm going to break. She started up the engine, continued on toward the airport. She thought about the Cheerios on Carly Raines' lips, the torn black plastic around Hope Coulson's body, puncture wounds and scratched soles and foreign objects. Stop, stop, stop. But this, this will never stop. This is all entangled in who I am. How was this the path I chose? What I knew would be littered with the fallout of the very worst that life has to offer. Things I was destined to pick up and examine and touch and smell and never sidestep. Maybe, if I'm lucky to climb over, or destroy with minimal collateral damage. Jesus Christ. She glanced over at Joe Lucchese. He was far away. Who are we? Were we born broken that we choose to exist in a world of broken things? Is that really the only place we can be comfortable? Where is the comfort? Where is it? We were wrong. We are wrong. 
Ren sensed a presence in front of her. She slammed on the brakes. She and Joe shout forward and back, striking nothing, holding tight. A woman glared at Ren through the windshield, slammed her hand on the hood of the car, pointed at the red light she was about to plow through. I'm so sorry, said Ren, mouthing it, making it clear. I'm sorry. I'm so sorry. This isn't me. What is me? Joe reached out and put a hand on her forearm, squeezing it. Are you okay? Yes, sorry. I'm... a mess. But she knew she didn't need to finish it. They knew what they both were. Departures was busy with people who looked so different to them, who had no idea who these two people were, brought together by an evil that had triumphed on a grand scale before it had died. Well, said Joe, I guess I'll see you around. Yes, they hugged. When they pulled apart, they looked into each other's eyes. Who are we now? To ourselves? To each other? Thank you for everything, said Joe. Thank you, said Ren. I don't know if I can ever bear to see you again. I'm so sorry about your friends, said Joe. You lost good men. Tears welled in her eyes. Don't cry. You might never stop. She managed to nod. Joe? Maybe don't say it. He looked at her, waited. Don't. It won't be the right thing to say. What? Said Joe. Biology is one thing, but Duke Rollins is gone. He's dead. He lives on nowhere. Nothing, said Wren. If you're ever in New York, said Joe. Thanks, said Wren. Safe trip. Daddy! They heard. They both turned to see Grace and Camille walking toward them. Grace started to run. Her little bowed legs. Wren gritted her teeth. Tears, tears, threatening tears. Greasy! He crouched down, holding out his arms. She jumped into them, burying her head into his neck, just like the first time Wren had seen her. Tears spilled down Wren's face. Not in front of Grace. No. She wiped them swiftly away. She could see the same from Joe as he kissed Grace's head. I missed you so much, he said. So intensely, Wren could barely stand to watch. Joe blinked away his tears, pulled himself back from Grace and stared into her eyes. Please find nothing there of Duke Rollins, please. Missed you too, Daddy. What are you doing back in Denver? said Joe. We're going on vacation, said Grace. Joe frowned. Camille was smiling. We're going to Disney World, said Grace. You, me, Sean, Camille, Granddad, Pam. Did you get a job while you were gone, said Joe. You're treating us all to a vacation? Grace laughed. Granddad got us tickets. And could never have imagined this weekend was going to end on anything but a graduation high. Joe raised his eyebrows at Wren, the, see, I told you my dad has to play the big shot look. Well, Granddad did a wonderful thing, said Joe. She helped, said Grace, pointing to Wren. Well, of course. She told us your flight number, your flight time said Grace. Sean is on the way. Joe was barely keeping it together. Distract, distract. You have fun, said Rem. Lots of it. Extra for me. Yay!
Yay, said Grace. Joe smiled, hugged Grace tighter, kissed her sandy hair. Wren walked away. Love conquers all. Chapter 73 Wren kept walking toward the exit. I will tell Ben nothing to hurt him, and I will never hurt him again. I know my triggers. I will not place myself at the end of that barrel. I vow to be well, to be sober, to be in control. You will never be in control. Yes, I will. You won't. I can try. You will fail. You always do. I will fight harder. You've said that before. I will not fail. You are helpless. I am not helpless. You are. You are sick. I'm not sick. Look at the destruction you crave. I don't crave destruction. It always finds you. You find it. You are magnetized. You are dark, magnetic, black as Duke Rollins. I am white light. You are delusional. I'm a good person. I am louder than your kindest thought. I win. I always win. You're a mess. You always will be. You'll always feel in your soul that everything is about to go wrong, and it's all your fault. Because it is your fault. You're the bomb. You're about to blow up. Didn't that resonate with you? Ha! You and inside your head and Duke Rollins and inside his. It's an adjoining hall of fucking mirrors. That's what this is. You can't escape it. There are only mirrors. No doors. No windows. Blinding reflection. No, no, no! Wren stopped, stood still, took out her cell phone. She scrolled through her contacts. Everett. Her heart sank. She kept scrolling until she saw Robbie's name. Hurt yourself more. Go on. Hurt. Do it. Dial them. Hear their messages. Hear them tell you they'll return your call. But they never will. You will never hear their voices again. Never laugh with them. Suffocating thought, isn't it? You're powerless. You can't change that, ever. They're gone. Ren started to cry. I'm so tired. I'm just so tired. Kill yourself, then. What's the point? End it. She struggled to breathe through the tears. Call Ben. He'll help you. Even though you know you hurt him. And you're a liar, you selfish bitch. I didn't mean to hurt him. I didn't want to. I don't know what happened. You can't help it, is what happened. You're weak and indulgent. I love Ben, with all my heart. No, you don't. You have no clue what love is. You're one of those people. No, I'm not. You are. All you do is ruin love. You wouldn't ruin something so beautiful if you truly knew what it was. I don't understand it myself. Stop it. Stop, 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 stop. Ren slumped onto the empty bench, buried her head in her hands. Tears poured down her face. I can't go any further. I can't move. Oh, God, I can't breathe. Please, no one see me. Security's gonna come. What will I say? I've lost my mind. I'll be sedated and carried away and... Breathe. Breathe. I am louder than your kindest thought. Get help. She sat on the bench, breathed, thought of nice things, breathed, controlled it. Just get to the jeep. Get that far. She sat into the jeep and started the engine. Regular things. Aftermath. Regular things. She drove. I'm going home to no real home. Pack a bag. Go to Janine's. You're going to Janine's. She felt relief at this one small certainty. Minutes from the apartment, the phone rang. Gary, don't get into it. He has problems of his own. She picked up. How are you doing? I'm home. I checked myself out. I'm good. 
Ren, where are you exactly? We need to talk. Could you stop by the house? But Ren had trailed off. She was looking ahead. Oh my god, she said. I gotta go, Gary. There's, it's, it's, it's my brother outside my apartment. She ended the call. She parked the car, jumped up, ran to Matt, threw her arms around him. Oh, thank God. Thank God. Thank God. Tears were spilling down his face. He couldn't speak. He was just holding her as she cried. How did you know what happened? She said. I mean, how did you get here so soon? Oh, God. What's wrong with him? What's wrong with his face? What is it? Said Ren. What's wrong? Oh, Ren. Wait till we get inside. No! Said Ren. No! What is it? Is it Mom? Dad? Ethan? I don't know how to tell you this. What is it? said Ren. Matt gripped her arms, looked her in the eyes. Gary called me a few days ago. He was worried you weren't taking your meds. He said you kept denying it. He was at a loss what to do. He called you, said Ren. A few days ago. Oh, my God. Was I that bad? Showing signs of mania? But why are we talking about this? Not just me, said Matt. He called Ben, too. He flew in yesterday afternoon. My flight was delayed. We were supposed to meet Gary and you and Janine and Robbie in the office. Oh, no. Oh, no. Please don't let this be what I think it is. So, was... Was that meeting yesterday... That was supposed to be an intervention? Rand put her hand to her mouth, then took it away to let the words tumble out. What the fuck? Oh, no. Oh, my God. She paused. Hold on. Where's Ben? If he flew in yesterday, I've been trying to get hold of him all night. Matt, wonderful, sensitive, kind Matt, managed to answer, despite his quivering mouth and the tears now pouring down his face. I'm so sorry, Ren. I'm so sorry. He was in safe streets when Duke Rollins arrived. What? Ben? He arrived early. He... He... Was shot instantly. He died, Ren. I'm so sorry. No! Said Ren. Someone would have heard. I went in that way. I saw... Rollins used a silencer. No, said Ren. I was in that lobby. There was no one there apart from that poor realtor, Valerie. Just Valerie's body on the floor. No one else, I swear to God. He's gone, Ren, said Matt. Ben's gone, sweetheart. I'm so sorry. But he can't be. She stared at Matt. Her heart plunged. Oh, no. The basement. The basement door was banging. Oh, my God. Is that where he put him? Threw him down into the basement? That's what he did with him? She studied Matt's face. He died instantly, said Matt. It was a single gunshot. He didn't suffer. Ren pressed her hands to her mouth, 
Her voice muffled as she cried, No! 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 Tears poured down her face, spilling over her hands. No! Not Ben. Not my gorgeous Ben who wouldn't hurt a fly. This is not my life. This is not my life. This is not my life. No! She said, collapsing into Matt's arms. No! 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 This is all my fault. This is all my fault. That was Killing Ways by Alex Barkley, read by Penelope Rollins. This program was produced by ID Audio for Harper Audio. Text copyright Alex Barkley 2015. Production copyright 2015 by Harper Collins Publishers. All rights reserved. Alex Barkley asserts the moral right to be identified as the author of this work. Thank you for listening. Audible hopes you've enjoyed this program.